Welcome to the show, everybody. Your host, Michael, on this open mic with Mike on a free-for-all Friday. Ask me anything, 1-800-484-3801. You can also put your questions in the chat. Make sure to send them to at Reason and Theology. I'll do my best to answer them. I have quite a few. Well, I, I should say I, I have a good idea of what the questions are going to be about. So <laughs> go ahead and send them. Uh, I'm going to pull them up here on my phone since it's a little bit easier to see. Uh, it, Instead of on the screen that's in front of me, I apologize. I have a teleprompter that allows me to see screens and everything in front of me, but I uh, still need to get a tablet for it. So uh, I'm just going to use my phone for now because it's just a little easier for me to see. Uh, Matthias says, we need your nuance. <laughs> well, yeah, um, I... <laughs> <laughs> Where do we begin, right? <laughs> and there's a whole lot of that to be applied right now, I'll tell you. Uh, I see Nate saying, how you guys feeling about Pope Francis's decision? I'm upset about it. Uh, Nate says, uh, let's see. Weintra says, open mic with Mike, LOL. Yeah, open mic with Mike. Free for all Friday. Ask me anything. <laughs> you catch the patterns there? Uh, let's see. Some advice. Go prudent on the current hot topic. Depending on what is said, people will react emotionally, Weinschel says. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sir, dude, how many tattoos do you have and which one is your favorite? Really, to be honest, if I could redo it, I wouldn't have any tattoos. But, I mean, like I said I, before, I, I got that when I was 19 years old. And um, it is what it is. And it's generally too hot for me to wear short sleeves. Even though I have the AC going in here, it's still a little too hot for uh, long sleeves. So I just generally wear the short ones. But if I could um, redo it, I probably just wouldn't have them at all. Uh, how many do I have? I think 14. Somewhere around there. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, about Hormizdas, some argue that the original letter didn't contain any of the papal statements or that the Greeks cut those out or that not that many bishops accepted it. Yeah, I haven't seen any actual substantial evidence for that, so please point me to it and I'll be happy to take a look at it. Um, it is noteworthy that those very, um, well, that equally assertive papal statements are still extant in Photius's. Uh, writings and in Photius is, uh, I believe, translations. Well, are they translations or just promulgations? I, I don't know how you would want to phrase that, but in his material, I think there were translations. You can go and look and see um, in the book, The Photian Schism, where this is talked about in more detail. And Photius leaves a whole lot in there that still lends itself to the uh, Catholic understanding of the papacy. So I, I find that curious. Uh, that, that he did that. So um, even without, let's, let's just throw out the formula of Hormizdas. We still have plenty of other things that attest to the papal claims, uh, but I'm not willing to give that one up. I'm not willing to concede and just say, oh, this is all forgery. No, uh, I need to see the evidence. Uh, how do you respond to Protestants that say that the early fathers taught Sola Scriptura? They did not. But what you can see is material sufficiency be insert, asserted by the fathers. Pretty much every statement that I've seen from the fathers that seems to teach sola scriptura, it's not sola scriptura, it's just material su sufficiency. So just go back and read those select passages from the fathers. Of course, read them in context, obviously. And read it as material sufficiency, and it makes perfect sense in light of other things that they've said elsewhere. Um, it doesn't make sense to read Sola Scriptura into the fathers in light of other things that they say. But it makes perfect sense to read what they say as long as we understand it as material sufficiency. It makes sense of all of the data. Um, which is, again, why I maintain material sufficiency. It seems to be the rule of the fathers, so I, I maintain that. Uh, the Basil quote, notwithstanding, because those pertain to liturgical customs. And what I'm re referring to, for those who aren't familiar, the Basil quote is, is from his work on the Holy Spirit, where he talks about traditions that are unwritten, but he's referring to liturgical traditions. He's not referring to traditions that are part of divine revelation. 
Um, Jack Dahl says, on this tridentine mass, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, yeah, well, I guess that's one way of putting it, right? I think some people are taking that position. I get the point. Uh, Cobra asks, are the SSPX in schism now? The faculty was above all motivated by the desire to foster the healing of the schism with the movement of Monsignor Lefebvre. Yeah, I caught that too. Uh, I caught that too. In, fa in fact, I have it in front of me because I know it's it's going to be the topic of today, most likely. Um, yeah, this is in, of course, his letter that accompanies the motu proprio. And um, it's kind of at the beginning. What was that second paragraph? Um, he talks about He's motivated by the desire to foster the healing of the uh, talking about Benedict. The, the, I'm sorry, John Paul II was motivated by the desire to foster the healing of the schism uh, with the movement of Monsignor Lefebvre. So at the very least, it seems that Pope Francis thinks at some point um, the movement was in schism. Whether or not it's in schism now is, is something else, but at least at one point. Um, there was a schism there. Um, is is this still applicable after, of course, some of these excommunications were lifted? He doesn't state, right? Um, it, so it's effectively saying at some point there was a schism here. Um, which, you know, I, I kind of find curious because let, let, let's let's talk about that for a second. Let's just say Pope Francis thinks at some point Lefebvre was in schism. Um, that really shouldn't have come as a shock to you. Because you should be aware Lefebvre says we are in schism. The, the actual church that's in communion with Rome is in schism. He says we're the ones in schism. Rome is in schism. You who celebrate the Novus Ordo, y'all are in schism. Not me, is what Lefebvre was saying. So Lefebvre accused us as, of, of schism. Um, so whatever good Lefebvre did, whatever virtues he had, there is that. And I, I think he was wrong for that. Now, I know he could be just kind of speaking rhetorically. I understand that. But I think that goes a little too far, saying that the, the current Rome is in schism from ancient Rome or old Rome or Rome of tradition versus modernist Rome. It's in schism, and those of us who are in union with it presumably are in schism too. Uh, so, I mean, let, let's just recognize that the accusation of schism was being thrown around from both sides. Um, ultimately, however, how do we determine unity? Well, of course, it's with the Sea of Peter, not with the Sea of Lefebvre, right? So, ultimately, my rule is going to be with the Petrine Sea. Um, unless we're going to become Eastern Orthodox now. Let's see. If there is any contemporary Christian music you kind of like or can tolerate, what would it be? Um, none. None of it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, if you like listening to that stuff in your private, you know, personal life, not out, you know, not during the liturgy, but outside of the liturgy, Okay, um, but it's it's not interesting. Or I'm I'm sorry, it's it's not my uh, cup of tea. I should say. Do the Orthodox have a biblical response to everyone is the successor of Peter? And um, okay, I just wanted to make sure there weren't any super chats. Um, do the Orthodox have a biblical response to everyone is the successor of Peter? I, I'm not following you because they're the ones who make the claim. I mean, we do too. We make that claim as well, that every bishop is a Peter in their diocese. But I guess I'm not following the question, do they have a biblical response? Um, maybe, maybe try to uh, clarify that for me. Uh, let's see. Uh, hold on. Getting a text message here. Okay. Making sure it wasn't a question. Uh, let me go to the next one here. 
By the way, the number again is 1-800-484-3801. What's your argument response to the argument against baptismal regeneration that the Greek word uh, translated for can also mean into, so baptism isn't strictly salvation? Yeah, um, ultimately, I first of all start with Romans 6, 1 through 6. And it seems that the analogy is that we are baptized into Christ. Well, salvation is in Christ. Um, we see Titus talking about the waters of regeneration. Regeneration of, of what? What are we regenerating? We're regenerating the second birth. I mean, we are no longer sons of the first Adam, but now we're being born into the second Adam. That's salvation. So people can play with words all they want, but I think the context ultimately is indicating that we're united to Christ in baptism. Call it whatever you want, but we're united to Christ in baptism. What does that mean? Um, well, I would say that means that we're deified and we're, we're, bring, we're brought into salvation. Uh, let's see. When are you doing a show on the Holy Father's new motu proprio? It dropped like a nuclear bomb, judging by the reaction of many. Yeah, I, I intend to do a, a show on it. Um, you know, I can answer questions right now, but uh, I do intend to do a whole show on it. I was, um, you know, I, I don't think I'll be able to do it tonight. I'm probably going to be going out of town this weekend, so it's, it's probably not going to be until Monday uh, that I would do it. Uh, Mazda, can we call or text? Either way, but if you want to call, it's 1-800-484-3801 for your live questions. Uh, let's see. Matt asks, in your opinion, does this abrogate the right of all priests to celebrate the Missal of Pius V as laid down in Quil Primum? First of all, go and watch my video on Quil Primum and whether or not it's irreformable uh, since you bring it up. But does this abrogate the right of all priests to celebrate the Missal of Pius V? Not necessarily, but what he's effectively saying is that the priests need to have, if they already have been celebrating uh, the Tridentine Mass, they need to have the permission of the bishop. And if they are, you know, after the motu pro proprio, new to the priesthood and, and are wanting to celebrate the uh, Tridentine Mass, they need to have the approbation of their bishop and Rome. Um, and there's reasons why. He, he gives the reasons why. Um, but in other words, one can still celebrate it with the proper approbation, either of their bishop or Rome and their bishop, depending on uh, when they're ordained before or after the motu proprio. And if they were celebrating the uh, Tridentine Mass before the motu proprio. Uh, we need a ticker at the bottom with the number, or at least it up on the screen. I can do that. Let me pull it up. There you go. And speaking of a ticker, let me put the Patreon on there as well. Uh, let's see. There we go. Jay Pronovis says, the ordinary form in Latin is great. Just my two cents. Yeah, I agree. I think it, be, it can be done very well. And for the average person, it's indistinguishable, really, uh, with the Tridentine Mass when it's done right, for the average person. Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. What's your question and name? Can you hear me? Well, I heard it hung up. I see it hung up. Uh, see a super chat. I know you've probably answered this question dozens of times before, but do you believe that the SSPX is licit and would it fulfill our Sunday obligation? It seems like to correct me if I'm wrong, but the most up to date information that I've seen is that um, it would fulfill one Sunday obligation, the best that I can tell. But, um, you know, when, when we talk about licit, I think what you're getting at is, is it really prudent to attend the Latin Mass? I'm sorry, the SSBS. Is it really prudent? 
Um, I think in most cases, it would not be recommended. And the Vatican also talks about this. It talks about how among some, there is a schismatic mentality. Not all, but among some, there's a schismatic mentality. So if you're going to attend, you have to be careful not to buy into that mentality. That would be my only caution. Are you going with a Padre Pio look with a beard? But on a serious note, do you have a devotion to him? And can you do a show on him, maybe? Uh, yeah, I would love to do a show on him. That's my patron saint. Um, but no, there, there was no intention to make a connection or anything. <laughs> Jared says, while the motu proprio places most of the authority into the hands of the bishops, they must still ask permission uh, from the Holy Father. Uh, Trin says lots of noise. Yeah, that's that's it's pouring like crazy outside, and I still need to sheetrock the the uh, the ceiling here. Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. What's your name and what's your question? Fine. Hey. Um, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, my name is Louie, and I'm calling because I'm interested in your perspective on. What makes an ecumenical council ecumenical for the Eastern Orthodox? For the Eastern so I know Orthodox? that you had a bit of a past. Oh, yeah. So what makes an ecumenical council ecumenical in the uh, ecclesio ecclesiological understanding of the Eastern Orthodox? So I know you've had a bit of a past with the Eastern Orthodox. So I was interested in your perspective about that. Are there really any viable um, understanding of ecumenicity other than the reception model? As far as the latter, in my opinion, no. Um, but of course, they'll tell you otherwise. Um, but this is one of the main reasons why I'm not Orthodox anymore, because I concluded, no, there's no viable alternative, alternative there in Eastern Orthodoxy. As far as what constitutes an ecumenical council in Eastern Orthodoxy, there's a really interesting video by Callistus Ware where he answers that question. And his answer is there isn't an answer. His answer is that this is still debated in orthodoxy. What he does do is he spends about an hour giving the different views in Eastern Orthodoxy, which include receptionism, the Pentergy view, things like that. Um, I didn't find any of the models entirely true. There, there's a grain of truth to some of them. There's a grain of truth really to most of them. But I wouldn't say any of them substantially defines what an ecumenical council is. They might give some accidental features here and there to use Aristotelian analogy, but I, I don't see them giving anything substantial. And that's what he concludes himself, that really there isn't an answer right now. And I think that's a problem. For me, that's one of the main reasons why I'm not Orthodox. So uh, that's been my observation. I don't know if you've uh, observed anything differently. What are your thoughts? No, that's actually been my conundrum as well in my studies of Eastern Orthodoxy, which is that there really is no way to determine when an ecumenical council really has the status of being ecumenical, especially because, as you mentioned, um, what's that's where it does go through all the different options in the Fordham University video that he posted on YouTube and... Uh, it's interesting because none of the options really fit in a way that you can take a look at a council and say that this is truly ecumenical. Um, and what makes it even more problematic is at the time of the council itself, it is viewing itself as authoritative. Yeah. So the reception model seems to be problematic because we have to wait and see whether or not it's accepted by the faithful, whereas the council itself obviously views itself much differently. That's been my cri criticism of receptionism, and it's been the same criticism that others have observed as well. That doesn't mean that there's not an aspect to reception in the Catholic Church. There is. And we can even talk about receptions of ecumenical councils. We, we can do that. Um, but ultimately, the standard, of course, is going to be the Petri ministry. Um, we could talk about maybe receptionism as far as the proper interpretation of a council if something is ambiguous. But as far as what constitutes an ecumenical council per se, 
I wouldn't say it's receptionism. I would say it's the Petri ministry. Uh, so if the Petri ministry recognizes it as ecumenical, it would be ecumenical. Um, that would be the objective standard that we would put forward. And to me, it seems the fit the, fit the uh, description of the ecumenical councils that we maintain. So, of course, they're going to reject sure. it because they, they reject our understanding of the Petri ministry. So, yeah. Now, it sounds like we have the same observation. So this brings an interesting point. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, it sounds like we have the same observations and criticisms of the receptionism uh, theory. Um, I, I just don't see it as adequate because, as you noted, um, it, it might take quite a f you know, few years before we actually know that something is ecumenical count, an ecumenical council. That could be very problematic. If we need to know what is authoritative at that moment, I can't wait 300 years. So I, I think that's one problem. I agree. Yeah. I think that also brings up an interesting point, which is that the ecumenical councils really were put in place, from my understanding at least, in order to combat certain errors and heresies, not so much as to define doctrine. It's perhaps in the Eastern Orthodox ecclesiolo ecclesiology that uh, the way that doctrine is defined is something similar to what we understand as the ordinary and universal magisterium, something that has been held together by the bishops of the different patriarchates um, for, for a period of time, and basically that's how they know whether or not a specific doctrine is, is, uh, uh, is to be authoritative. Do you think that's an accurate understanding? If I'm understanding the question correctly, I think that an ecumenical council can do both. It can define what a doctrine is, and it can also respond to error and heresy. It can do both, and it should do both. The Ecumenical Council is a solemn uh, gathering of the bishops throughout the world exercising their teaching authority, which has been granted to them by Christ. And so they have every right to teach, not just to respond to error and condemn heresy, but to define matters of faith and morals. Um, so I, I kind of see it as a both and. If I've understood your question correctly, did, did, I, did I understand it uh, right? Was that a response? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Now, as um, far as the ordinary and universal magisterium, yeah, I mean, that's, that's again, another expression of the teaching authority of the church. It's less tangible because, of course, the difference between an ecumenical council and the ordinary and universal magisterium is going to be an ecumenical council is documented, whereas the ordinary and universal magisterium is not documented in any one particular instance, unless we maybe want to argue that maybe a papal... Uh, teaching or something like that gives voice to the ordinary and universal magisterium. Um, but then it's no longer the ordinary and universal magisterium per se, uh, I would argue. But um, yeah, I would, I would say the ordinary and universal magisterium, it, its particular feature is that it's not documented, but it can still define and teach and correct error. I hope that helps answer the question. It does. Thank you. And um, I had one last thing that I'd like to discuss as well, sure. um, which is in relation to this. So when we have a situation where um, we see at least exteriorly that there have been contradictions between the ordinary magisterium um, of the popes, such as through encyclicals that have not been extraordinarily defined um, or other teachings of the popes, um, and we see contradictions between that and prior teaching. How do we reconcile which of the two has more authority? I've read Dr. Joy's um, dissertation on this, and I found it to be somewhat helpful. But in terms of practice, I mean, when we see things like the death penalty, for example, or changes in liturgical discipline or um, other aspects of life, such as religious freedom or um, the relation between state and uh, the church, we see that there are quite a number of contradictions um, in terms of teachings, and not everything, of course, is on the same level of authority. But then again, how do we determine the level of authority of each particular document? This is not only a great question, it's one that's very dear to me, because that's what I'm writing my dissertation on. This is a very important question for me, um, so I really appreciate you asking it. You also brought up the death penalty, which is curious, because... That's probably going to be the case study that I use in the dissertation is, is addressing the death penalty issue towards the end. 
Um, so as to your question, first, I would I would challenge, however, the claim that there's been plenty of these contradictions in the ordinary papal magisterium. So authoritative, non-definitive teachings of the papal magisterium. I would challenge that there's been actual um, contradictions, that there's been many of them. I can think of only a few. Um, I can think of a lot of apparent contradictions, just like in scripture, there's a lot of apparent contradictions. But when you get down to it, they don't contradict each other. I can do the same thing with the papal magisterium. However, at the end of the day, I can say that there are few actual bona fide contradictions and reversals in the papal magisterium. Um, and and that's, that's, that's possible. And again, I think that it's happened, but I do think it's rare. Because I would say even though these teachings are not infallibly taught, there's still a general protection of the papal magisterium even when it's it's non-definitive non-infallible teachings there's still a general protection there um and i have quite a few who would back me up including john paul ii um but again as to the exceptions that there could be a contradiction okay what do we do right let's say you have one pope who teaches x and another teaches not x which one do we give assent to? This is the entire question about weighing magisterial propositions. If you have an actual contradiction between two uh, or more popes, you give assent to the one with the higher weight. And it's not necessarily the most recent that has the higher weight. For example, let's say uh, you have Pope Francis teaching one thing, and then you have uh, Pope Leo XIII teaching something else. Do you automatically presume that Pope Francis has the higher weight and you are to assent to his teaching? Not necessarily. It could be, let's say, maybe Pope Leo XIII taught X in an apostolic constitution and Pope Francis, Pope Francis teaches not X in a papal homily. Now, Pope Francis is more recent, but a papal homily is way less than an apostolic constitution. Or what if Pope Leo XIII uses more force in his language than Pope Francis? Or what if um, Pope Francis teaches something in a papal homily that's not even the topic that he's really addressing? It's just a off-the-cuff, by-the-way remark, whereas Pope Leo XIII is writing an entire apostolic constitution on this particular topic. All of that factors into how we weigh a magisterial proposition. Those are just a few indicators, but there's more. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to weigh the magisterial propositions by looking at those objective indicators, the document, the language used, how central is it to the, um, to the document that it's issued in, how close is that teaching to the deposit of faith and, and to the, in relation to the hierarchy of truths, I should say? Um, all of that factors in. All of it. Um, so once you've properly done that, then you can determine, okay, here's the one that I am to assent to. Because um, at the end of the day, it is possible that there could be a contradiction. And you know that you have to assent to ordinary papal teaching. So which one is it? Well, it's the one with the higher weight. Does that help answer the question? Yes, definitely. So it seems that the enterprise is heavily theological and historical in terms of being able to determine this. So in terms of practice, like for us, for example, it, obviously we can't just as laymen do this ourselves. At least I'm speaking for myself. Um, so how, how do I know? Um, do, I mean, are there theologians that speak and weigh these matters and we can follow these theologians that way or is there a, di a different way in the practical order of things? Sometimes the magisterium itself does it. Uh, sometimes theologians will evaluate the propositions. I'm um, wanting to prepare the information to where uh, the average Catholic uh, can do a at least a fair job at evaluating magisterial propositions. Um, there are there are some basic principles that we could all use. I mean, as I mentioned before, an apostolic constitution versus a homily, 
if there's an actual contradiction between the two, you know assent is owed to the apostolic constitution. But of course, we know things sometimes get a little bit more complicated than that. What happens when you have two papal encyclicals that seem to contradict each other? Well, it's the same level document, right? Uh, as far as the, the weight of, of the document. Okay, well, now which proposition was central to the document and which one was maybe perhaps just incidental to it? Uh, what kind of force and language and frequency and repetition is used? We can start to look at those objective indicators, and I think that the average Catholic should be prepared to do that to an extent. But yeah, I mean, I, I get that you know not every Catholic is going to go do that. Sure, that's why we have theologians, and that's why we have ultimately the magisterium. Because what happens if you now have two different theologians who are really um, wrestling over the death penalty issue and trying to determine, okay, well, uh, is assent to be given to the reforms of Pope Francis in this matter? Um, and, and if one theologian says yes and one theologian says no, okay, well, now you know we, we need something a little bit uh, more authoritative than that. At that point, it is the obligation, it's obligatory, if you will, uh, for the magisterium itself to step in and issue an authoritative uh, reconciliation or explanation that, okay, this previous teaching has been overturned and reversed and the current teaching is, is the one that has the higher weight. Or if it was the one previously that was issued uh, that, okay, the current teaching is going to be revoked. Uh, so it would be, you know, the obligation of the magisterium itself to come out and clarify these matters. I hope that helps answer a little bit. Sure. Yeah. No, it definitely does. And the reason why I ask it is, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of lay people um, argue back and forth things in relation to the death penalty and in relation to uh, the dogma of no salvation outside the Catholic Church. And everybody has, to a certain extent, viable evidence that can be used to sway a person to one opinion or the other. And when you have things like Cantate Domino, for example, yeah. teaching something and then um, later iterations of ordinary magisterium, perhaps maybe clarifying it or perhaps in certain views contradicting it, I think at that point it really does deserve um, a more authoritative treatment uh, rather than just lay people bickering back and forth about it this is one of the main reasons for this very topic this is one of the main reasons why i'm doing this dissertation especially outside the church there is no salvation uh that that really piqued my interest in this particular topic on the magisterium so um i, I really I, look forward to it <laughs> yeah it, maybe also check out the i don't know if you've seen it but the lecture that i did on the history of outside the church there is no salvation um I, I try to offer a reconciliation of um, the Council of Florence, is what you referenced there earlier. Uh, the Council of Florence and more recent teachings from the 19th century onward, um, especially um, Pius the Ninth. Um, I, I try to offer a reconciliation because, really, with the discovery of the New World, which is just shortly after the Council of Florence you start to have a shift and a development on this particular issue uh, because the discovery of the new world really put um, it really it forced the theologians, I should say to have to develop certain things about the doctrine. So I would still maintain the council of Florence as true and what, what it taught us true or Boniface the eighth, I maintain what he says is true. It just needs to be properly understood with a couple qualifications. Um, and I think that's what later generations offered were the, the proper qualifications that need to be added to those propositions. And I don't think they overturned them. I don't think that they reversed them. I don't think there's a contradiction. I just think we need to understand the development. Um, so go and check the lecture out if, if you haven't already. Uh, just type in, outside the church, there is no salvation, Michael Lofton. It'll come up. I will do. I have not listened to it. Really appreciate your work, and I'm looking forward to reading your dissertation as well. Yeah, thanks for the call. Really great questions. All right. Thanks so much. Have well, let me take this. You too. Let me take this other call here. Sorry, y'all. Um, Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. What's your name and question? 
as Joseph. Hey, Joseph, how are you? And, uh, hello. Yeah. Yeah, love the show. Hey, I wanted to ask, um, uh, with this, with this new moto, I don't understand how the Pope has the authority to, I guess you could argue this isn't an outright ban, but it's heavily restri- restrictive right. of the Latin mass. Right. Uh, it seems to me that the Pope uh, has the authority. You know, it's not the Pope's mass. In other words, it's God's mass. And isn't the Pope sort of like a uh, caretaker of yeah. the deposit of faith? So I don't understand how the uh, the Pope has the authority to put like restrictions on priests. It's it's like they have to request permission now to say the mass. Mm-hmm. It's like putting a restriction on like you have to say you have to get permission from the bishop to say the Hail Mary or something like that. I guess that's. That's what I'm kind of curious about. Well, um, a couple of things going on here. Number one, he does recognize that he is the guardian of tradition and guardian of the liturgy. That's how it starts out, guardians of the tradition, the bishops and communions with the bishop of Rome. Um, They recognize that they're guardians. They're not the inventors or authors or anything like that um, of the liturgy. And, um, yeah, as far as restrictions on the Hail Mary, of course, we, we do want to note the difference between uh, private devotions and, of course, public uh, liturgies, which he notes himself explicitly explicitly in here that the Mass is, is a public expression of the Church. Um, so it would be a little bit different than telling a priest, okay, you can't say the Hail Mary, uh, because that would be a restriction on his private uh, life, spiritual life, rather than public liturgical uh, expressions, unless he's saying, okay, well, in public, you can't say uh, the Hail Mary during the liturgy or something. That that would be a little different. Um, but now, as to your question, does the Pope have the authority, which is, of course, not the same as asking, should he do this? Should he exercise the authority? We're just simply asking the question, does he have the authority to abrogate certain expressions of a liturgy, um, certain elements of a liturgy? Well, the popes have been doing that for quite a long time. So if they don't have that authority, it's not new with Pope Francis. It wouldn't be an abuse of Pope Francis alone. It would be an abuse of um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of uh, papal papal changes, Um, which is, of course, one of the arguments that the Orthodox are going to use. So um, I would say, yes, he has the authority to make uh, certain changes to the liturgy. Um, and I argue that based on Vatican one. In fact, I have a show about a week ago where I go over this in detail and I show that the Pope has full power and authority over matters of faith and morals, but also government and discipline, which includes the liturgy. Now there are some limits, of course, right? The Pope can't come up with a new faith. The Pope can't change the existing faith. Uh, The Pope can't completely, entirely, substantially change, let's say, the words of institution or something like that, right? Um, There are certain limits, but as long as it's not a substantial change to something essential to the faith, yes, he does have the authority. Should he exercise it in the way that he has? Now, that's a different question. Um, but does he have the authority? Well, can I ask something right there? Yeah. Okay, can I ask something? Because I think you hit the hit on the nose there. Uh, you said like a you know substantive change. You said something like that, a substantive change. But the Latin Mass, yeah, it developed, but it developed out of the actual faith, like the actual dogmatic faith that we hold, and everything in the Latin Mass. I would argue, is substantive. Mm-hmm. So it's like, what I'm saying is, is uh, the authority of the Pope, I don't see how it can no. drastically restrict like actual tradition that harkens back to dogma, in my that, opinion. Like, that, it's like untenable. another... Well, I think that's an untenable position. Popes themselves have made changes 
to the Tridentine Mass from well, primum unto the present. I mean, Pius V himself made changes to the very mass that he was, um, that he effectively put forward with quote primum. They don't see that as a substantial change. Neither would I. So there are aspects to the Tridentine Mass that pertain to the substance of the faith, and then there are accidental features to it. I wouldn't say everything is pertains to the substance. Nobody takes that position. I don't know how anyone could take that. That's untenable. But weren't those changes that were developed out of time, mm. and you could you had a strong justification? It would seem to me that mm. tradition would have some kind of restriction on oh. the Pope's authority to drastically change mm. things. I mean, like it, otherwise, it would be like every time you get a new Pope, you get something new. You get a Pope that says, "Oh, I don't like Gregorian chant. I like." Uh, mm. Barbershop quartets. Now we're going to have barbershop quartets. You know what I'm saying? Sure. And, and I agree with you that there, we, we shouldn't be tampering with the liturgy. We, we should be very reluctant to make any kind of change. So I, I agree with that. I mean, we shouldn't just constantly flippantly change things. Um, but I, I would say that, no, some of the changes were unilateral and were not necessarily organic. Um, some of the changes that Pius XII made, um, they, they weren't just organic developments. And frankly, even prior to Quo Primum, there were certain aspects to the development of the Roman Rite that were not organic. They were done by papal mandate. Um, you just simply need to study the history of the Roman Rite to see that. There, yes, a lot of the developments were organic, absolutely. But there were some unilateral modifications to the Roman Rite for a very long time from I mean, the 8th century, 9th century into the present, it, at the very least. In fact, earlier can be argued. Um, so I would say, okay, if there could be unilateral changes made then by the Pope, why, why not necessarily now? So it's possible. I, I would say he's able to do it. The question now is, should he, right? Now, now we get into the realm of prudence rather than authority. But anybody who's saying he doesn't have the authority, I think we now have a, a serious serious substantial problem with the faith i think that person is now really going against the understanding of the papacy and is now creeping into protestantism or eastern orthodoxy which is what i'm saying a lot right now as far as the response to the motu proprio say whatever you want about it but to say that okay well um i'm going to completely resist the pope or we're going to go to war with the pope and things like that that are being said out there it just sounds like protestantism to me so like with an example that justifies what you're saying is, uh, and what you're saying, I mean, I'm, I'm not disputing it. It, it sounds accurate. Uh, but to justify like what you're saying, when it, could an example be like when they replace the Celtic right with the Roman right? Would that be an example that's kind of similar? That's a similar, but not exactly analogous to what we have going on today. But maybe... Um, with that... You know what I what I would recommend to do? Get Adrian Fortescue's book, the the Roman um, Mass. I think it was called uh, the Mass. It might just be called the Mass. Um, get that, and he goes over the history of the changes of the Roman Rite, and he's going to show you. You know, at one point, if I recall correctly, the Our Father wasn't even said during the liturgy. There were there were things that weren't done in the liturgy that you would be shocked, and it required actual papal changes to make those changes when it comes to the Roman right, I should say. Um, I would say those are a little bit more ana analogous to what's going on today. But what we can do is we could probably just, okay. if you want, I can just break out Adrian Fortescue, review it a little bit, and I'll give you specific examples that would be a little bit more analogous to what's going on today. And I would just have to say, okay, awesome. well, awesome. If, if Pope Francis can't do this, then we need to follow this we need to be consistent, and we need to apply that to previous popes and now say, okay, well, if popes don't have that authority, why are we still Catholic at this point? I mean, weren't the Orthodox right all along, or weren't the Protestants right all along? Because if I can make these same criticisms about popes for the last thousand years, that is a, that's a problem, right? If the pope doesn't have this authority, I should say. Now, if he does have the authority, I think we can still maintain the Catholic claims. Now we can ask the question of, however, yeah. should he make this change, right? 
yeah, you're smart because I was trying to trap you. And it's probably not a good argument I was going to try to make. But you didn't take the bait. Was my argument was going to be because a lot of like neo pagans that try to claim that the Celtic rite meant that the early uh, Christian uh, Irish uh, weren't actual Roman Catholics, but that's nonsense. It was very similar. There was just some little differences that they squabbled over, but they were all Roman Catholic. But I, I guess one thing that I would say is, is but isn't the Novus Ordo kind of so radically different from what the faith, the, the actual mass has always been? That's what isn't I would it challenge. such a radical? Di- That's what I challenge. Now, if you, if what you're saying is true, um, we I think it either follows that Eastern Orthodoxy is the case, set of Acontism or Protestantism. If what you're saying, if if that were to be true, I don't maintain that though. I don't think that there's a radical rupture with the uh, Novus Ordo. Now, I'm talking about it objectively speaking, right? I don't know what Father So and So down the road does. He might abuse it so bad that it's not even recognizably the Roman right. I don't know. I'm just talking objectively what has been promulgated by the Holy See, what is there officially and objectively, and what should be done and celebrated. No, there's no substantial change, not only to the faith, but to the Roman rite itself. And that's what Pope Francis himself notes, that the Mass of Paul VI effectively is the unique expression of the Roman rite. Um. Not not facing God isn't a substantive change. You're facing man. You're putting the focus on man instead of on God. That's not a substantial change. Hold on. Give me one second. Little man came in here. Give me one second. Let me take care of him. Give me one moment, y'all. All right. Sorry about that. We're back. That's what happens when you're a parent and you do things live. So <laughs> anyway, no, you're a good Catholic. You're, you're bringing, you're bringing Catholics in the world. You're a good Catholic. Hey, you know what? I had to take care of a little man. So he, he was afraid of the thunderstorm is basically what was going on. <laughs> so anyways, um, <laughs> now you were asking a follow-up question there. I didn't catch it though. Go, go ahead and ask it again. What? It was just more of a comment. I was going to okay. say, well, isn't, I mean, like you're facing in the, like in the Novus Ordo versus the Latin Mass, you're facing man versus facing God. Oh. Uh, communion in the hand versus communion on the tongue. Right. The focus is on man. The focus isn't on God. Those aren't substantive changes. I'm not denying that the, the Novus Ordo is valid, but to me, these changes seem pretty substantive and it seems it's, really substantively changing the nature of our faith by denying us the mass that unites all of us in the Latin right. Okay. So a couple things here. Uh, those would not be substantial changes. Although I, I, I think that um, masses should be done um, fa- facing liturgical East. I don't think there's really any good reasons to do versus popular, but I don't think that it is a substantial change. No. Um, 
Now, I will note that very technically speaking, the way the Novus Ordo rubrics are written, it assumes that we're doing ad orientum. Um, so if we're just talking about what's officially true, the priest should be doing ad orientum, not versus popular. But the fact that they don't, I would not say this is a substantial change. You mentioned communion in the hand. How is this a substantial change when communion in the hand was the way of doing communion for nine centuries? It wasn't until the late 800s before the Roman rite started to make changes here and started to do communion on the tongue. For the vast majority of Catholic history prior to the ninth century, it was communion in the hand, east and west. In fact, the Sixth Ecumenical Council seems to forbid anything other than communion on the hand. Now, some are going to point out, well, it was done differently. Not really, not really. But you will find in some cases where communion on the hand for women, not men, for women, they were required to put a cloth on their hand. Not men, women. Um, and to me, it seems that that was pretty rare, very localized, and uh, not very widespread, uh, not very, you know, um, frequent or anything like that. So um, you might be able to point to some differences in communion on the hand, historically speaking, but they don't seem to be very different. Now, the question could still be asked, okay, but should we do communion in the hand today? Should we? I think no. I don't think it's the best approach. I don't think it's a substantial change. I don't think it's evil. I don't think it's wrong. But I don't think it's the best approach at this point, especially today, given how careless people are, given how few believe in the real presence. It's just not a good idea. I, so I would say it's prudentially not a good decision, in my opinion. Uh, but I wouldn't say it changes the faith and it's substantially different. I, I don't see that. I hope that helps answer your question. Um, well, I guess I lost them. I don't see them there. So hopefully uh, you, you got the answer there on uh, live. Now, I see a few super chats. Let me take those. Uh, put this one on from Jared. Let's see. You may have covered. Ah, it moved on me again. Hold on. You may have covered this in a previous video, but could the Pope put restrictions on Eastern rites? Also, could he reestablish other defunct rites? Uh, rights? Is this simply a disciplinary issue? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, he, he could, when it comes to the Eastern rites, right? He could. And in fact, the um, Second Vatican Council and its liturgical reforms seem to... Uh, apply somewhat to even non-Roman rites, so one could argue uh, e even the Eastern rites. Um, but that, that's a whole other discussion. But could he? Yeah. Should he? Probably not. I think that would be extremely imprudent in most cases. The only time that he should make a change to uh, the Eastern rite is out of necessity, if it's absolutely nece necessary for the good of souls. In that case, yes. Anything short of that, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I uh, see a couple other super chats. Let me see if I can grab them. Uh, let's see. And please let me know if I miss any. I don't want to miss any here. Uh, the next one I'm seeing is from <clears throat> Michael. Uh, let's see. Sacro Sanctum Concilium, paragraph 36, was perhaps too open regarding the vernacular use. Um, would it benefit for Rome to eventually dictate which part should be vernacular Latin? I, th I think so. I, th I think it would be helpful at this point, because at this point, it's effectively all the vernacular, right? And I don't think that was the intention of uh, the Second Vatican Council. There are parts in there where it says it's really up to the bishops and Episcopal conferences to determine what extent of the vernacular is going to use be used sure but i don't think that they were saying that they intended it for you know um all of these episcopal episcopal conferences to just say let's do vernacular only i don't i don't see that either um yeah maybe it was up to them to determine the extent but 
Latin should still be preserved according to Sacra Sancta Concilium. So I don't think it was the intention to just entirely get rid of it. So would it be helpful for there to be some particular rule? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Eric asks, does last section in the Article 3, does last section in Article 3 mean Pope Francis wants to hamper the spread of Latin mass communities? Or is it, oh, hold on, it's moved on me, hold on. Okay. Uh, or is it related to Latin mass orders like FSSP and schismatic like SSPX, basically defined groups? Um, Article 3, and you say the last paragraph, right? Uh, I, I was thinking you were talking about paragraph 2, but... Let's see. Article three, last section would be paragraph six. To, to, yeah, that part, I, I saw that too. To take care not to authorize the establishment of new groups. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's going to apply to everyone, not, not just uh, groups like the SSPX and not just FSSP, but any new group. And that's one of the parts that I just thought, okay, prudentially, I don't know if this was a good idea. Why not just say, okay, it's up to the bishop whether or not he's going to authorize new groups. But to say to take care not to authorize new groups, I think that might be going a little too far prudentially. I mean, he has that authority, but I just, I don't know if that was the right approach that he should take. His intention, from what I recall, is um, he's wanting to eventually bring those communities back into effectively the ordinary form. Which I get the gist, and ultimately I think it's a good idea. It's insane that we have two forms of the one Roman right. That's insane. We we really need to have one form of the Roman right, but for the time being, it might be necessary to have uh, two forms, unless we're going to start um, reforming the ordinary form and making it more traditional. But I think that's ultimately what should happen, is that we should have one form, but it should be much more uh, traditional and um look a little bit more like the extraordinary form than it currently is. So that's kind of his intention is to bring those communities um, back into unity, full unity here. Not that they're essentially out of unity, but um, as far as unity when it comes to practice in the Roman Rite. And so I get his intention, and I think the intention is good. I just, I'm not sure if the way he executes it is going to be helpful. I think that it it might cause some unforeseen or unintended problems. And so, um, let's see. Uh, Dr. Kwasniewski claimed today that the Pope doesn't have the authority to restrict the priest's right to celebrate the Latin Mass by requiring the bishop's permissions thoughts. Yeah, I don't see that as a tenable position. I think that one is already heading to Eastern Orthodoxy or set of a or Protestantism when they maintain that. I, I don't see that as compatible with Vatican I or the Catholic faith. Um, yeah, I saw him saying earlier, we're, you know, if the Pope wants war, we're going to go to war with the Pope. Or It was something to that effect. I'm, I'm not quoting him verbatim, but the Pope wants war. I hope enough people enlist to perform war. I, we sound like Protestants at this point. I, I hope we realize that uh, when we take this approach. We're going to go to war with the Pope. Uh, I'm sorry, this sounds like Martin Luther to me. Um, I, I think that some of this is fear-mongering, it's insire, inciting uh, schism and dissent, and it's problematic, so I, I don't agree with what was posted there. Uh, Michael B., my thinking without Rome eventually dictating vernacular Latin, the faith, uh, faithful can easily be liturgically jolted by each successive bishop's judgment. Yeah, I mean... I mean, in theory, it's a good idea to put things into the hand of bishops, but some of these bishops are not going to use their authority very well. So um, in theory, it makes sense. But in reality, we know some uh, bishops are going to use their authority poorly. So thoughts on Francis banning new FSSP parishes? Sorry if that was already answered. I don't... I don't know for sure. This is where I would need to get a, a um, canonist on, a canon lawyer, because I, I don't know for sure if the language is going to ban new FSSP parishes. Maybe, but I I don't know. I, it To me, I could read this in a way that it would not, right? But 
ultimately it's not going to be so much about my reading, but more uh, what, what's what makes sense canonically, what the experts are going to say uh, when it comes to some of these distinctions that I'm seeing in here. Um, so I don't see that, but I might be wrong, right? I might just not be reading it properly. Um, when would you do a stream on Ad Orientum according to the proper rubrics of streaming? Yeah, I think that that's actually a really good idea to do just a whole show on it. But go and check out the new liturgical movements website and just maybe type in Novus Ordo Ad Orientum and they'll give you examples of where the rubrics indicate it, that it assumes Ad Orientum. Um, let's see. Not sure if you mentioned it earlier. Do you see realistically that a novice order that moves closer to traditional is actually in the cards? Honest question. Yeah. Um, are, are you talking about in, in the in the document or just in general? Um, now, I, I think I get what you're saying. Do I just think that this is going to happen? In other words. Yeah, I do think so. I think so. In, in time, the Novus Ordo is going to become a little bit more, um, it's going to be reformed a little bit closer to the uh, traditional Latin Mass. Um, that was kind of the purpose of Sumorum Pontificum, so that they would enrich each other. And according to Pope Francis, in the survey he sent out and the feedback from the bishops, it seems that that goal wasn't really being achieved. And his main concern is that uh, some people in the traditional Latin mass communities are maintaining a schismatic position and are using the Latin mass and the traditional um, Tridentine mass to dissent from the current magisterium, from Vatican II, from the new mass, and I see that. I've witnessed that. I observe that. And that's a real problem. Um, so I think the intentions are good to fix that issue. I'm not sure that everything that he has done to execute it is, is going to help him to that end. Um, but I get the intentions, and I think the intentions are good. That being said, uh, okay, I, I'm all on board with correcting certain rad trads that are schismatic and need to be reined back in. I'm all for that, but what are we going to do about the liberal bishops? And what are we going to do about abuses in the Novus Ordo? Now, he does talk about the Novus Ordo should be celebrated rightly, and he's disheartened by the fact that there are liturgical abuses on all sides, he says. And he tells the bishops they need to do their best to correct that so that the Novus Ordo and the Latin Mass are celebrated properly. So... He he's guarding against liturgical abuses everywhere, and he wants to correct the bishops to correct liturgical abuses. In reality, though, we know that most of them aren't going to. The ones that are going to are the ones that already have been, and the ones that haven't been probably aren't going to change after this one. So we need something with a little bit more teeth to fix the liturgical abuses. So my thing is, okay, we're going after the radical traditionalists, the you know a schismatic mentality okay all right not sure i would take this particular approach not every aspect to it at least but okay he's the holy father he can do whatever he wants uh when it comes to this matter as far as it's within his power and it is um but you know it, is it uh it, it's curious that we're not also equally with this much vigor and concern um doing the same for liberal priests and liberal bishops. I mean, he talks about in here, he's really concerned. Uh, let me see if I can find it. That he's really concerned about a schismatic mentality and problems going on and, and people who are rejecting the Second Vatican Council. Those are all legitimate concerns. Um, I think I may have found it. Let's see. Well, it's in his letter to the bishops. Yeah, here it is. With the passage of 13 years, I instructed the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith to circulate a questionnaire to the bishops regarding the implementation of the motu proprio sumorum pontificum pontificum the responses reveal a situation that preoccupies and saddens me and persuades me of the need to intervene. Okay. 
All right. And I understand that. But why aren't we also preoccupied and saddened by the liberals in the church? I, why aren't we preoccupied and saddened by Father James Martins? I think that we should be equally preoccupied and saddened by them, and we should intervene. I mean, with all due respect to Pope Francis, let's be consistent. Let's not just go after the rad trad schismatics. Let's also go after the liberal schismatics. Because, frankly, they're a bigger problem. I mean, as far as larger numbers. Um, there's more liberal priests and bishops and liberal Catholics than there probably are radical traditional schismatics. So um, I understand the need to be preoccupied, saddened, and intervened. But can we also do that with the liberals? And if not, upon what basis do we correct the radical schismatics, but not the liberals? I, I don't understand. It, it seems, um, it seems unequal, and it seems we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Now, that's ultimately on Pope Francis. He's going to have to answer for that. He's going to have to give an account to God. Why is it that he? is saddened by problems in one section of the church, but not elsewhere. Well, again, he's going to have to give an account for that. Uh, okay, let's see. Can God in this life convert someone to Protestantism or Orthodox Christianity without revealing the fullness? Peter Kreeft once told a story of an atheist being told by God to become a pastor. Can God in this life convert someone to a Protestant or Orthodox Christianity without revealing the fullness? Um, I would say that God can prompt somebody uh, to certain things, but ultimately the same God who is prompting them to maybe become a pastor or something like that is going to prompt them to enter into the Catholic Church. I mean, that's what Vatican II says. Um, the Holy Spirit, when he's working outside of formal membership and the visible institution of the church, it's to bring them to the visible institution of the church. So if somebody says, God told me to become a pastor, and you know what? That's all God told me, and... They never believe that God calls them to the Catholic Church. I'm not sure that's God then, because the same God who would have called you to the, you know, being a pastor for whatever period of time is the same God who would be calling you to the Catholic Church. So I don't buy that. I don't think that God would call you to an incomplete uh, relationship with him. That doesn't make sense. So I, I, I'm not buying that. Uh, what else we have here? What do you think of the Latin Novus Ordo Masses at John Cantius? Yeah, I was, I was at one, and I loved it. I thought it was awesome. Um, I think that is the way forward for the Latin Rite. Thoughts? I, I agree. I agree. The, and that's what he's saying in here. It. He says towards the end of the letter to the bishops, look at what he says here. Uh, let me find it. Whoever wishes to celebrate with devotion according to earlier forms of the liturgy can find in the Reformed Roman Missal according to Vatican II all the elements of the Roman rite, in particular the Roman canon, which constitutes one of its more distinctive elements. He's right. If you want to have a traditional approach to the Roman rite, you can have that with the Novus Ordo. He's right. And we need to. We need to take back the Novus Ordo from the liberals. Take it back. Don't abandon the Novus Ordo and just... Run away to the Latin Mass. Take back the Novus Ordo. Make it traditional again. I mean, stop letting the liberals abuse it. We need to take it back. It's curious. It seems like at first that's what happened. I mean, uh, there, there seems to be evidence that for two years, Lefebvre celebrated the Novus Ordo. At least there's a letter indicating that he did. 
I'd like to see if, if that can be confirmed or not. Um, and then after a couple years, that changed. And if it's true, I think it's indicative of the fact that the Novus Ordo can be done right. It's just that people are abusing it. So now we associate Novus Ordo with abuse, and we shouldn't. We need to take back the Novus Ordo. Do it right. Same thing with the Second Vatican Council. Stop associating that with modernism. Start associating it with tradition. Take back Vatican II. It belongs to us as traditional Catholics. Stop giving all of our stuff to the liberals and just abandoning it to them. Take it back. It doesn't belong to them. It belongs to us. And we need to use it properly. So, I, I mean, I, I just, you know, I hope people take heed to what the Holy Father says there. But um, I, do, I do still think that there are parts to the new motto proprio that um, it's going to be counterintuitive. I'm not sure it's going to help him accomplish the end that he intended. Um, and I'm not sure some of this was even necessary to accomplish that end. That being said, it's within his authority. So, uh, what else? Hmm. Oh, thank you for the super chat, uh, Giovanni. Uh, you need to change your position to add orientum. The icons are behind. So the next stream, you got to face the icons. Behind. <laughs> That's funny. That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> one argument against baptismal regeneration. Well, hold on. Let me go ahead and take this call. Call it your life with reason and theology. What's your name and question? Hey there. Uh, my name is James. Hey, James. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. Um, uh, really glad to be calling in. I've been watching since uh, you and Eric were in cars doing this. <laughs> um, so you've been watching uh, <laughs> from the beginning, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause I at first because like way back, well way back when that's such a millennial term. I'm 25, so yeah. But uh, <laughs> um, Eric, I saw that Eric um, originally posted it to his channel but then when reason theology got going i was like oh look at this thing this looks cool so um yeah um but anyway so glad to be calling and uh question i wanted to ask was i haven't read the full thing which i kind of feel bad because that i usually like to fully read things but i there's a paragraph in the article that came out today based off the mode proprio from um adam uh, Dr. Adam DeVille. Um, I, I don't know if I'm saying his right, name right. Yeah, I had him on um, before. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, on Eastern, on yeah. his book for Eastern uh, yeah. Yeah, Orthodoxy and Catholicism. Um, but he, he wrote, um, I typically like what he says, and I guess this was mainly kind of puzzled, but he basically, his thoughts were basically that this is sort of evidence that the papacy has become too big and kind of too powerful and that this is sort of an infringement and that basically traditional Catholics can sort of lock arms with Byzantine Catholics and also the, the non, uh, he seemed to allude uh, in the article to the um, Orthodox, not in communion with Rome, um, can kind of uh, lock in arms with them about basically sort of um, canonical regularities and how things should like ordinarily go in terms of like jurisdiction and liturgy and stuff. And, um, in terms of like following your patrimony of your specific right. And he, he kind of seemed to infer to, he basically too in that, um, from the paragraph I read, he, he also argued that the papacy since 1870, um, has sort of gone astray from the primacy, uh, that developed prior to it and i don't know if he's necessarily if i'm reading him right if he's necessarily arguing for sort of discontinuity i know there's some eastern catholic theologians that kind of go more critical on the papacy and and even uh go, um you know affirm almost like primacy of honor type of thing um but i just wanted to know like um if you saw that article at all or like what do you think about that in general yeah i haven't seen his article so i can't comment on it specifically but I'll, I'll definitely uh check it out because that that does sound interesting um is there a sense in which the papacy probably micromanages some things too much probably um but isn't 
what Pope Francis doing in here reversing that problem? Isn't he putting things back into the hands of the bishops? You would think that you, the more Eastern churches would be happy with this because he's putting things back into the hands of the bishops and micromanaging less. So I, I don't see it. Right. That's why I was kind of curious about, and, um, you know, I'm open to correction on, on this by anyone, uh, any of the audience that's more informed, but I mean, I'm all for, um, synodality and like collegiality as like understood by, um, uh, especially like, yeah, yeah, it's Congar, um, and his contribution to Vatican II, um, especially his book, because I, I read his book several months ago on the papacy after 900 years, and he's very, you know, congenial and uh, makes some concessions or like uh, the Orthodox makes fair points here and there, but at the end of the day, he basically sees this as harmonious with like synodality and collegiality as harmonious with papal primacy and Vatican I. And so to me, I guess I'm, sh I'm kind of, a little bit, I guess a little bit confused. I don't know. I probably just, you know, ignorance need to study more on this, or at least his article, but yeah, cause like I've heard that from some other Eastern Catholics and I know sometimes there can be kind of a lot of internet debates on like the authoritative status of Vatican one, not so much as in like how typically like Western Catholics talk about it at a magisterial level with notes, but it kind of seems, um, just relegated to like a local synod by Eastern Catholics um, and so forth. Well, I, I guess here's here's my question. Uh, does the Pope have the authority to, uh, or I should say the duty, to shepherd the universal flock and protect it from issues and problems? I would think so. He's supposed to protect right. the flock. Yeah from problems and errors and things like that. Well, one of the problems that he's noting is that some in the traditional community are using the Latin mass um, to maintain and harbor a schismatic mentality that pits itself against the Novus Ordo and against the current magisterium and against the Second Vatican Council. And I understand the need to correct that, and that does need to be corrected. And I take a lot of heat for trying to do that the best that I can as just a layman with a camera, right? Um, now, he has the real authority. He can do a whole lot more about it. Um, but I, I, I agree with him there. I think that that needs to be fixed. My only criticism is just be consistent. Do that to the liberals too. Correct them. There's a whole lot of them. There's a lot of liberal dissenters out there. Aren't you doing anything about them? Please do something about the liberal bishops. Please do something about the liberal pri priests because it, it's not good mm -hmm. enough to just fix uh, the problems when it comes to radical traditional communities. You also need to do that with the um, but does he have that duty? Does he have the duty to protect the flock and to care for it and to guard against errors and uh, to bring about unity? Yes, he does. And that's what he's intending to do here. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that this goes against his authority. So this is going to be one that... Um... I hear something in the background. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't say this goes beyond his authority or that this is the papacy getting too big for its britches, as, as you put it. I, I don't see that in this particular case. I see him actually putting things back into the hands of the bishops, which makes a little bit more sense. Although I know that's going to be problematic because some of these bishops aren't doing very good and shouldn't be in the episcopate to begin with. So they're going to abuse it. But that's part of the problem. I, right. would put, I would put this back into the bishops and get rid of all the liberal bishops. Let's do both. Let, let's let's right. address yeah. the schismatics uh, who are on the far right radical traditional uh, side of things. Let's address them, but let's also get rid of the liberal bishops and others like that who are also abusing things. So I don't know. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. It, it, it's because I kind of had mixed feelings when I, I read it earlier today, and because um, like I know in some areas, especially in the United States, um, you know, it, uh, hearing the news of it being um, put in the hands of the bishops, it's not so much bad news if you have a good bishop. Like I live in Steubenville, so it's like, oh, yeah, I, there's not going to be problem here. But really. there's a problem um, to begin with. But, right? I mean, we look. Is it the? Is it? Um, is it not the case that the bishop, and he notes this even in the document, is to guard the liturgy in his own diocese and is to guard and protect the faith? Yes, it's the case. 
That's already the right. case. Yep. But what happens if you have a liberal bishop? Well, he's not going to do a good job at it. We have this problem already. Whether or not he puts this particular authority into their hands or not, we still have this problem with or without the motu proprio. And that is the problem of bad bishops. And that needs to be equally addressed, if not more passionately, in my opinion, more passionately addressed. Because he's the one who can do something about it. I, I mean, it's the Pope right. who's yeah, able to exactly. do something. He is an authority over those bishops. He can do something about it. He should. And and so when I read him saying he's saddened and disheartened seeing this stuff, oh, okay, I am too. But, I mean, I'm saddened and disheartened seeing the liberal bishops abusing all kinds of things and and who don't belong in ministry to begin with, but still retaining their position. And why aren't we doing something about that? Right. Yeah. Those are all fair points. And that's, it, it, it's, it's just kind of, yeah, it's difficult. I, I guess, I mean, it's, um, I don't know, like, I guess in terms of like the charitable interpretation, if I want to put it that way, or it seems yeah. like every Pope addresses things from their own sort of um, milieu or paradigm, not that they have a different worldview, but like they have their own sort of disposition and emphasis. Sure. But I do think it, you're right that there is sort of weakness in terms of as problematic as a lot of stuff, it, like the anti-Vatican II stuff is and um, uh, 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 vegan O stuff is. Um, it's. I saw this meme today, which I found kind of prudent. It basically said, um, "It said, oh, the Pope is the Pope is going to um, address the Church about something." important and, and locked down on like reform and the person responds saying, Oh, uh, sexual, sexual abuse, cover ups, financial scandals and liberal dissidents promoting abortion. Yeah. Uh, right. And then the guy's just kind of quiet, he's like, right. right. <laughs> and it's just like dead silence. And so it's like, yeah, yeah. so like, you know, there's definitely right. I uh, mean, a fair <laughs> prudential criticism. <laughs> right. It, it just seems unbalanced. And, and so I don't have a problem per se with trying to rein in some some of these potentially problematic people in the traditional camp. But I still have to say, but we need to be doing that with the liberals with probably two times more passion and vigor and concern. I mean, there's some people in ministry who don't belong in ministry. There's some people who need to just be absolutely excommunicated. We need to have nothing to do with them. But right now we're taking the medicine and mercy approach, and I think that has failed. Uh, we've been taking the medicine of mercy approach ever since John Paul, I'm sorry, not John Paul, John the 23rd's opening speech at Vatican II. We tried it. It was a train wreck. Let's learn from our mistakes and move on. Yes, we need to be merciful. Absolutely. Absolutely. But not to the exclusion of disciplining and excommunicating people. And that was effectively the route that we took. And we, we need to just say, look, that failed. It was a disaster. Uh, what we had thought is that people were good enough to do the right thing if you don't just come down on them and discipline them in a harsh way. Yeah, that, that's not the case. We had too much of an optimistic view of humanity, and people don't do the right thing. So we need to just say, hey, this failed. Throw out the medicine of mercy, and let, let's take back a more rigorous approach and start disciplining uh, some of these uh, dissidents and um, get them out of the church. Um, at least bring them first of all to repentance, if possible, and if not, if they're going to be obstinate, get them out of the mm -hmm. church. So I don't know. That's my two cents. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I appreciate those uh, thoughts, Michael, and uh, keep up the keep up the the nuance. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks for calling. I'm gonna go to the next caller. God bless. All right. Bye bye. Uh, let's see. Well, then. Uh, I think I got it in time. Sorry about that. Call back. 1-800-484-3801. Uh, I'll take uh, at least one other call. Uh, here it is. Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. What's your name? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, you're live. How are you? Oh, uh, okay, hold on. Sorry. I'm on. Um, yeah, so, hi, I'm Xander. Yeah. Uh, just one of the like say thank you for taking my call and also yeah. uh, thank you for doing this. This is a really important stream, I think. Yes, sir. Um, and so I, I mean, I've been looking around, um, and uh, my first question was just regarding the like the idea of con celebration. Yeah. Um, can bishops make 
their priests can't celebrate. Mm. Um, like for example, with the S or S S S P in uh, France, I think it was. Yeah. You know it. Um. So. so yeah. So. Um. I'd have to ask if there if there's something in FSSP's constitution that says that they can't celebrate the Novus Order or something like that. Um, if there is something in there like that, then I could maybe see that. But aside from any provisions like that, I think that uh, the bishop can. I mean, it, it, what what happens is, at the end of the day, the bishops in his territory are effectively his ministers and his servants, and they are to uh, be his agents, if you will. Now, I know the FSSP is a little different. I get that. I understand that. Um, but I don't know if there's anything in their constitution or their makeup that says, okay, they can't celebrate the Novus Ordo. If there is, okay, then that would be beyond his authority. You know, if the Pope has said, okay, I approve this uh, this norm or I approve this rule for the society, uh, I'm sorry, for FSSP, um, you know, you're, you're not going to celebrate the Novus Ordo. It's, it's going to be strictly the Latin Mass, and you can't celebrate the Novus Ordo. I could see then that being beyond the authority of the bishop, but I don't think that's the case. And by this modo proprio, that sure doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Um, so mm -hmm. I um, I would say that it, it, it does seem to be within the authority of, of the bishop, unless I'm missing something essential here. I haven't really stopped. Um, yeah, it, if, am I missing something? Um, I'm I'm not taking the position either way. I was just I just wondering. Like, uh, there was Canon 902. Mm -hmm. Um, is, is one that's been brought up a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, let's go to by uh, a guy I was arguing with in the or not arguing with, but just discussing with in the, in the chat. Um, and I mean, if you want if you want me to read it or what have you, or you want to read it yourself, or and it, that apparently points to that they can't do that just. Or justly, rather, excuse me. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I, uh, can, you, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead and read it. Yeah, so it says, uh, I'm not, and I'm not really seeing it, but maybe, maybe, so it's, unless the welfare of the Christian faithful requires or suggests otherwise, priests can concelebrate the Eucharist. They are completely free to celebrate the Eucharist individually, however, but not while a concelebration is taking place in the same church or oratory. Yeah, but it doesn't seem to be addressing specifically if your bishop there requires you to come and concelebrate. What am I missing? What, okay. is, what is in there that would specifically address that? And that's kind of what I said as well, was yeah. I, didn't, I didn't see it. I'd be interested to um, hear a, a canonist on that particular one. I'll also need to go look okay. through my canon law commentaries on canon 902. Yeah. Perhaps we could do a whole show on it. I'd need to study a little bit more on that. Um, but he, mm -hmm. here's a, the, the other principle that I'm concerned about, and that is, again, um, the bishop overall is the authority on the liturgy in his own territory. And if you won't come and con celebrate with him, I have to ask on what basis, right? On what basis do you refuse to come and come and celebrate with the very one that you are to um, be obedient to and at the service of? You know, priests aren't free agents. So for priests not to want to come and celebrate with his bishop, I have to ask why. Um, if it's on a matter of principle, because I... Uh, think that the Novus Ordo is evil or wrong or something like that, then we have a problem. Or because I think that this bishop, uh, I can't celebrate a liturgy with them on a matter of principle. That's a schismatic problem. But if it's something like, well, I, I, I just haven't been trained in the Novus Ordo. Okay, we'll get trained in it. It, it won't take you long. <laughs> it's not hard. Yeah. Uh, so get trained in it. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the things that you're supposed to do as a priest is celebrate liturgy. So go ahead and get trained in it. And now you can join the next con celebration and you can't use that excuse anymore. So I'd have to ask uh, on what basis would you not, unless there's something in the constitution of the society that just says that you know, they, they cannot celebrate the Novus Ordo, but that doesn't sound familiar to me. I, I've never heard of anything like that. For the FSSP, but I could be yeah. wrong. Yeah, 
I like for, for me the, the most superfluo. I think that I think that most people can agree that it, it's potentially not good at all. Um, and I, I'm not. I, I am. I'm trying to be. I'm going to be obedient, and I'm trying to. I, I take the the stance of Saint Padre Pio, and I, I just if 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 I'm, if I'm wrong, or if he's wrong, then let God decide eventually. And Saint Padre Pio was vindicated in the end. Um, so. Like when yeah when I when I see that they're not they don't want to come celebrate or I see this motu proprio kind of going after parishes who are or, or um, priests at parishes who are celebrating like for example I go to um, an Italian parish where they it just ha- it's just one priest who celebrates the Latin mass it's a low Latin mass um, and I go to the Novus Order as well like the day before on Saturday for the vigil and for me it just seems like he's punishing and I'm not saying that every I, I said this in chat earlier as well I said that it seems like he's going after the wrong groups of people. I'm not saying that every person who goes to FSSP or goes to SSPX is like schismatic, but that's not, it's not the, I never make that generalization, but I'm saying that there are, there are elements. And I think, I mean, you can disagree with me here, but um, there are elements in those, in those groups, as opposed to the actual parishes that are like, they were on schismatic. Yeah. I mean, so, I, and, I, so I, I just think that it's prudentially it. bad. Um, but I mean, sorry, that's, what, that? that's what he's trying to fix is, is the people who yeah. are schismatic and try to bring them in, uh, in line with the post conciliar church. That's what he's trying to fix. The question is, is this going to achieve it? That's the question. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's going yeah. to long term. We'll find yeah. out. And, um, one more thing I just wanted, if you've been, I don't mean to like name drop him or, um, just, but I mean, uh, Steve Skojak, have you been keeping up with his Twitter? Uh, occasionally. Yeah. A little bit. I mean, it just kind of, I just, not to end on like a sad note, because this is my last question. I want to let the next caller get on, what have you. Yeah. But um, it just seems like really, it's really sad, kind of. And I, I think he's a good guy. But like a lot of the stuff, it, it, he just, it's just very depressing. Well, I've told to look him. Look at it. Yeah, I've, I've told him that. And I've, you know, explained. And this is publicly that I've told him this, so I'm not saying anything that you can't already read on Twitter. Um, I've told him that I don't think he's taking the best approach, but I completely get where he's coming from because I used to be there. I used to feel the exact same way. Um, I think over time that's going to change a little bit, but it, only time is going to heal some of those wounds. Uh, but I completely get what he's going through, why he feels the way that he feels. As I told him, I think that this does not need the, the concerns that he has don't need to be aired out publicly. I don't think that's helpful. Yeah. Um, and, and Cause it seems like it's scandalizing a lot of people. I'm not it, saying it's, it, it's yeah, him. I know that's not his intention, but I told him, uh, you know, publicly yeah. on Twitter that I don't think that this is what needs to be put out there publicly because people are going to become scandalized and they're going to become discouraged. This is not helpful. Um, yeah. But at the same time, if you but, don't have anything current, um, encouraging to offer you're just going to post discouraging things so i i get it but like i said i think he just kind of needs to take a step back and, and not post this stuff until um he comes to a point that he is more encouraged uh because it's just going to bring other people mm-hmm. yeah so um but yeah that's all i had um thank you for taking my call i really appreciate it yeah great call thanks for calling uh let's see have a good one god bless you, you too uh, take one more here. Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. What's your name? Hey, can you hear me? Testing. Hello? Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, but it's it's sounding odd, like you're in the background. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I got you. My bad. Um, no, bad. so I was just wanted to get your thoughts on this too. I haven't watched the whole live stream, so I don't know if someone's already brought this up. Yeah. Um, but I think that it seems a little, uh, a little premature to say that this is putting it back in the hands of bishops, mm-hmm. because if you look at the, the text of it, a, I'm sure we've mentioned that you have to the or newly ordained priests have to get the authorization not only of their bishop but the Holy See. Oh, the Holy See, yeah. But it I'm also says, that. yeah. But, but it also says that the bishop to take care to not authorize new establishments. Right. Yeah. And this seems to be kind of in 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 line with what 
was reported that uh, the new CDF had said, which is that we're going to give power back to the bishops, but only to the liber- or not the conservative ones. Do you think that's accurate, or do you think I, there's something I'm missing here? I don't. I don't think it has to be interpreted that way. But that particular part, um, that was Article Three, Paragraph Six to take care, not yeah. to authorize the establishment of new groups. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. Again, yeah. long story short, I just I don't think that should have been put in there. I think that um, it should be it, it should be left up to the bishop whether or not he's going to authorize new groups. What's the purpose of not establishing new groups, uh, of prohibiting it? Well, I think it's clear why. He says why, because he's wanting to eventually yeah. bring them in to the Novus Ordo. Um, he's wanting to yeah. eventually phase it out and bring them into the Novus Ordo, which is, I think, a good intention as long as we're making the Novus Ordo much more traditional than it's celebrated right now. I think that that's a good intention. Uh, the problem is we need to do more to make the Novus Ordo better and make it more traditional. We can't just bring people into the Novus Ordo and not properly do the Novus Ordo. Um, so I think that's why he says that in Article 3, Paragraph 6, but I'm, I'm not sure that was the best approach. So I don't know if I agree with, with him doing that, but he does have that authority, right? So, I mean, time will tell whether or not that's oh, for a sure. yeah, yeah. provincial I'm decision. I'm just wondering how to interpret it. Yeah. I'm not sure that's a good idea, but um, as far as is this going to uh, put things back into the bishops, but not the conservative ones? I, I mean, I could see how you would interpret, you could interpret it as that being the intention, but I gave you another example of what would be the intention there. Not that it would be, okay, we're going to put things back into the hands of the bishops, but not the conservative ones. No, because the conservative ones have the same authority here. I think it's much more likely that the intention is what he says in the document itself, and that is to eventually phase out uh, the traditional Latin Mass and bring them into the ordinary form or the Mass of John Paul VI, I'm, I'm sorry, Paul VI and JP II, trying to find the part where he says it but um it, it's it's in there I'll, I'll see if i can find it here in a little bit i think that's so, much so, more so likely you, the intention it, just one more thing do you, do you, so do you think that that uh that then means that he's not only obviously it's abrogated uh tomorrow but do you do you think that that also means he's repudiating uh pope benedict uh it, it, like theology that was behind his original uh his original decree I, that's in not 2007 the that I got from the letter to the bishops. He tells us why he's doing this. And in the letter to the bishops, uh-huh. he explains, here's what Benedict's intention was. And according to the survey, it has not been achieved. In fact, what has happened is some of these traditional communities are using it as a means to dissent from the magisterium, which is not what Benedict wanted. He wanted to correct that. So to really preserve more the intention of what Benedict the 16th was trying to accomplish there, he imposes these reforms. And so it is what well, I think it is isn't the distinction though, that Pope Benedict bifurcated the right. So he's saying that the extraordinary form should like, is, yeah. is perennially yeah, 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 yeah. valid versus I, I if, do see if, a Pope, difference if Pope Francis wants to move it towards only, I know. I do see a difference there with Benedict the 16th yeah. and Francis because Benedict talks about the extraordinary form and ordinary form. And Pope Francis addresses this. He addresses it explicitly. Uh, but then he calls it the unique, calls the Novus Ordo, the unique expression of the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite. Um, it does seem to be a little different than Benedict here when it when it comes to that matter. Um, I, I, I'll be honest, I... Benedict's bifurcation there never really sat very well with me. It, it's odd, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that we would have two forms to the Roman rite. Why not have one form to the Roman rite and do it right and celebrate it traditionally? Why divide us into two groups like this? It doesn't seem helpful. I think that the intention was, well, it's divided already into two groups, hopefully by doing by calling it ordinary form and extraordinary form, it's going to mutually enrich each other and maybe eventually turn into something united. But Pope Francis is saying that isn't the case. So uh, he takes these, you know, 
he's, he's making these reflections. Yeah, that, that for sure makes sense. I think that, like, I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't think that, I think Pope's going to disagree on that sort of thing, but I'm, of course. I was wondering. Yeah. I think, I think there Thanks, is sir. somewhat of a difference in the way Francis sees the Roman Rite and Benedict XVI saw it in Sumo Pontificum. I think there's some discontinuity yep, sure. there. I might be wrong. Maybe somebody can reconcile it for me. But to me, I, I did notice some discontinuity there. But this isn't the first time there's been discontinuity between a pope and his predecessor. Um, I can. Course, I was yeah. telling somebody the other day, John the Twenty Second had some pretty significant uh, discontinuity with what was it? Uh, was it Nicholas the Third? I forget which one it was, but with one of his predecessors on the issue of the. Uh, spiritual Franciscans and Franciscan poverty. There was some discontinuity there. Yeah. And this is what gave rise to the whole controversy on papal infallibility was the fact that there was discontinuity here. So we've had discontinuity between popes and their predecessors for a very, very long time. So it, it, this isn't anything new. Yeah. Thanks, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Hey, great question. <laughs> Thanks for calling. Uh, let's see if there's any other calls. I'm not seeing any right now. Call 1-800-484-3801. I'll take at least one more. Uh, let me look at the chat. And Can you hear me? Um, okay, I'm sorry. So you were able to hear me, but nobody was good. Uh, well, let me go ahead and answer with that, my answer right. because uh, you could hear me, but nobody else could. And I'm not sure how I got muted. Um, I wonder how long I've been muted. <laughs> Is, <laughs> I wonder if it was only for the duration of this call. If y'all could uh, specify. 
I'm going to look in the chat. To see, uh, how long was I muted? If y'all can specify that way, I can just quickly um, answer. Okay. For two minutes. All right. Well, let me just briefly repeat what I was saying. So the question was, sure. um, what do we do about article three, paragraph two, where Pope Francis says that the uh, Latin mass is not going to be celebrated in parochial churches um, or new personal parishes. And the question was effectively why and, and what's going on here. And, and my response was, I see the same problem. That part jumped out at me as well whenever I read this. What's the reason of taking this out of parochial churches um, and not in new personal parishes? What, what's the purpose? I know the intention at the end of the day is to bring about unity in the Roman rite. And the intention is to prevent a schismatic mentality. I get that. I understand that. I applaud it and I have that same goal. But at the end of the day, is this necessary to bring that about? I don't know. And, and so I'm scratching my head on that one as well. So I'm looking for answers on it mm -hmm. uh, too. So that was effectively my answer. And I apologize. I was muted. there. Uh, any follow-up questions? Yeah. Um, no, I just found that very strange and it just made me wonder, you know, is it going to have to be celebrated in basements or some I was wondering chapel, that. I mean, where, where strange are you gonna chapel put or... Right. Where, where do you put them if not in parochial right. parishes or uh, new parishes? Where is what I wrote on here? I, I just wrote where then, question mark. <laughs> where are they supposed to go? I don't know. I don't know. Yep. <laughs> They've got to go uh, somewhere. Well, thanks so. for taking it. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's very strange. Well, Thanks, Michael. Love the show. And, you know, we're all globe pilled. So I'll talk to you later. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for calling. Uh, <laughs> Caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. Uh, give me one second. There was a super chat there that I wanted to take, and then I'll take your call. Give me just one moment here. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, one second. Let me see if I can find that super chat because I saw it up there. Hold on. It's not coming up on the screen in front of me, but, but let me see if I can pull it up uh, straight from my phone. Um, nope, it's not on there as well. Okay, well, could you please put the question of that super chat back in there for me so that I can uh, get to it? Because I really want to uh, answer all those super chats at the very least. So I apologize. Uh, put it back in, put it in all caps. And just say this was a super chat question, and uh, I'll do my best to get to it. Um, the chat's looking really lively, so <laughs> I think it only shows you so many uh, in the chat, and so it, it disappeared pretty quickly. Um, all right, Colin, you're live with Reason and Theology. Can yeah, you hear me? Love the show. Hey, Thank I you. Want to ask, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, jo Joseph, I called earlier. Sorry for calling twice. No, you're good. I accidentally hung up. Uh, I'm Gen X. So I'm, at, I'm Generation X, so I'm half Boomer. So it's Boomer X. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, By the way, I hear okay, a little so, like, echo earlier, in the background. Can, can you mute the television or uh, computer or something? Yeah. Let me try. By the way, Jared, I see your super chat. I'll answer it next. And isn't the Pope sort of like a... Uh, Is that better? Um, I'm still hearing it. So I don't understand how the... Uh, Is that better? The no. Put, like, for, for some reason, I'm still hearing it. Um, I, I figured it out. I figured it out. It was on actually on my end. Uh, it was playing oh. on my YouTube, and the, U the phone's connected through the soundboard. I apologize. Go ahead. You there? Yeah. All right. Go ahead with your you question. Good? Yeah, it's fixed. Oh, sorry about that. You good? Uh, okay. So you were saying earlier, like, uh, okay, the Pope has the authority to make these. I don't know if you're like uh, labeling them as like a restriction, but I think it. I mean, it's safe to say that this is like a restriction on the Latin Mass, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so, so saying the Pope has an authority. Um, but kind of talking about should he, yeah. But like bringing it to the lady, um, 
don't lay, don't the laity like have the right to Catholic culture, like authentic Catholic culture? Yeah. I mean, there's like examples of the laity in the past, usually with like kings and whatnot, actually arresting bishops or actually stopping heretical priests from teaching false narratives or false things. And I mean, if the Catholic laity feel that by restricting the Latin mass, it's actually harmful to the spiritual life to themselves and their children. Don't they have a right to, yes, ask, of course, our bishops and our Pope for the Latin mass, but if they won't, give us what we need, don't we have a right to to have that, to have that Catholic culture? Like it, I would envision like, you know, you know, a grassroots activist campaign, but also even like, say, you know, uh, a city state in the United States, as an example, where Catholics gain political power and they actually legislate to the local bishop, you have to have the Latin mass available in every church in your parish. Do you think the lady have that authority in terms of using the power of the state to actually, as they view it, defend the faith? Mm. I mean, historically, the, the state has definitely uh, done done some things to kind of put, um, put things back in balance, but then it also has done a lot to disrupt the faith. Uh, but I, yeah, I can think of some cases where the, the state has defended the faith and, and stabilized things and uh, put pressure on the Pope to do the right thing. All, although in the majority of cases, it was the opposite. It was usually the Pope who was doing the right thing and the emperor wasn't. Um, but yeah, the, the role of the state, now that's something completely different. Um, the emperor as, as the defender of the laity uh, yeah, a whole lot that can be said there. I think it would be helpful if we had a uh, Christian state that was defending uh, our interest at this point and maybe putting pressure on the Pope to do the right thing in some cases. I don't think that's a bad idea, but it's a it, it's a two way street, right? I mean, the the state could end up doing very bad things and imposing um, putting pressure on the Pope to do bad things, which is kind of what's going on now. The state is already. Doing, putting a lot of pressure on the papacy and the church to um, to cave in on some moral issues. Um, no, but as far as your question, do we have a right to tradition and a right to a certain expression and things like that? Look, we already have that in the ordinary form. We have a right to the Roman rite, yes. Uh, we have a right to our tradition and our faith, yes, and we already have that in the ordinary form. Here's again, to quote it again, here's what he says. Whoever wishes to celebrate the devotion according to earlier forms of the liturgy, and by extension, those who wish to uh, attend a mass uh, under this description, can find in the Reformed Roman Missal, according to Vatican II, all the elements of the Roman Rite, in particular the Roman Canon, which constitutes one of its more distinctive elements. The point is we already have our patrimony and everything in the in the ordinary form. We just need to do it right. We're not doing it right. We're not celebrating the Novus Ordo right in most parishes. We have let the liberals take over the Novus Ordo, and that's a problem. And we need to celebrate the Novus Ordo in the right way. And people won't feel deficient anymore. They won't feel like they're missing something in their patrimony if we just do the ordinary form in the right way. They'll feel satisfied. Their, their need to have the Roman rite in a traditional way will be met if we just do the Novus Ordo in the right way. So the problem is not so much that the Pope, that the Pope is wanting to bring people into the ordinary form. The problem is we need to also issue a motu proprio uh, fixing a lot of abuses in the Novus Ordo. Now, he does talk about fixing abuses in the Novus Ordo, he, Ordo here, but it has no teeth. The bishops who are not doing anything about liturgical abuse, they're not going to change after this no moment of propio. And the bishops that are fixing issues of liturgical abuse are going to continue to do it after this no after this moment of propio. It's not going to change. You have to have something that has teeth behind it to fix the abuses. It's not enough to just sit here and write moto proprios and say, hey, bishops, please fix the, the abuses going on in, in the Novus Ordo. Please fix them. That's not good enough. 
that hasn't worked for the last however many years. I mean, it hasn't worked since 1969, effectively. Telling people to do the right thing and expecting them to do the right thing, that doesn't work. We need to have teeth. We need to back it up. Unless you fix problems and liturgical abuses in your church, you're excommunicated. You're gone. You're out. I mean, at the very least, you're removed from ministry. And if you just continue to be obstinate in, in certain things, maybe you get excommunicated. I don't know. We need to put teeth behind our discipline. And, and, and we're not doing it. We're not disciplining people. So if we just discipline uh, our bishops, I, I'm saying as a pope, if, if you just discipline the bishops, make sure they're doing the right thing, people will find the Novus Ordo celebrated well, and they won't have a need to go back to the Tridentine Mass because they'll find all of those elements in the ordinary form. So, I mean, I, I hope that helps to answer your question. Did you have any uh, maybe follow-ups to it? Well, yeah, the, it, doesn't this in its motto, I believe the Pope, he alludes to the fact that there are people that prefer the Tridentine Mass, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, so the fact that he, he admits that, and he doesn't, again, this isn't an outright ban, that to me suggests that that's an admission that the Latin Mass, well, I think it's an admission that the Latin Mass can't be banned, but I think it's also the Tridentine Mass, and but I think it's also an admission, obviously, that some people prefer the Tridentine Mass. Yes, yeah, some people. So if do. if they things are if, if but if things are if we're going to respect and recognize preference, then I don't see how you and this is and because I guess the argument I'm trying to make isn't and saying anything ill about the Novus Ordo anything at all, but. What I'm saying is, is that for those of us who feel that the extraordinary form of the Mass is the tether from the present day to Calvary, if you're a person of European descent, any person of European descent, the Latin Mass is the tether back to the time when your ancestors were pagans and first converted the top to Christianity. That those of us that feel that our tether to tradition, I don't see how that can be denied us by right. And maybe it's not dogmatic. I, I understand what you were saying earlier about substance. This and the other thing, but like for instance, in the Roman Rite, priests being celibate—that's not dogmatic either. But that's a tradition that leads back to dogma. But we it, have- it's a tradition that leads you. But we have all those elements in the ordinary form. They it just the ordinary form needs to be just celebrated properly. That's that's all. So we have all those rights already. It just needs to be celebrated properly. And the average Novus Ordo. Well, if we have all those elements, why not just have the Latin Mass? Though? Why not just have the Tridentine Mass? Because there and, have, not, and not celebrate the Novus Ordo. Sure, because there have been some reforms to the Tridentine Mass in the ordinary form that needed to take place. There was a need to reform certain aspects of the Latin Mass. There absolutely was a need. May I ask what those were? Yeah. Uh, restoring the chalice to the laity. Let's start there. That's a big one. That's a huge one. Um, I'm sorry. Can you, I yeah. Can you repeat that? Sure. Restoring the chalice to the laity. That's a big one. Uh, I see. There were, there were some. Now, I think we sometimes went a little too far. Uh, so we can talk about even reforming the actual Novus Ordo objectively, the actual thing objectively speaking, not abuses. I, I think that we could beef up the prayers a little more. I think they took a little too much out. We could beef up the prayers more. We could add some of the prayers that were taken out. They talk about the prayers uh, for the conversion of Jews and things like that. I think we need to bring that stuff back. Um so, I mean, there are some elements that I, I think the pendulum swung a little too far and we need to uh, reform the reform. But then again, there, were, there was a need to reform the Tridentine Mass, and that is why we had Sancta Sanctum Concilium. Um, and so just simply returning to the Latin Mass doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But what does make sense is for us to, yeah, bring the Novus Ordo back a little bit more to... The middle. I think we little, went a little bit too far. And that's just speaking objectively. 
feet on the ground, the way we actually experience it, it's something way different. And that's a problem. Um, so, I mean, I'm all for eventually uh, unifying the Roman right and bringing that about, but there's a lot of other work that needs to be done, and it's not being done in this mode proprio. Here's what he says. Indications about how to proceed in your diocese are chiefly dictated by two principles. On the one hand, to provide for the good of those who are rooted in the previous form of celebration and the need in the need to return in due time to the Roman rite promulgated by Saints Paul VI and John Paul II. And on the other hand, to discontinue the erection of new personal parishes tied more to the desire and wishes of individual priests than to the real need of the holy people of God. So what he's effectively saying is, Eventually, his intentions here are to, in due time, um, basically bring about one form of the Roman rite, and that it would be uh, the Reformed one, the one of Paul VI and John Paul II in light of Sancta Sanctum Concilium, which makes sense. It sounds good in theory, but you have to actually put teeth behind it and bring it about because it's not good enough to, let, let's just say at the moment, Let's just pretend that everybody who attends the Latin Mass just all of a sudden start going to their Novus Ordo parishes. Is everything going to be okay? No, it's not. They're going to end up attending Novus Ordo parishes that are in a terrible, terrible shape, that are not doing things well, and just simply telling people in this modo proprio, hey, fix the liturgical abuses, that's not good enough. You need to put teeth behind it. What we need to do is, yes, eventually in due time have one form of the roman rite but fix the abuses with uh actual force behind it i mean get rid of the the bishops and the priests who are not going to celebrate it properly who are abusing it get rid of them remove them from ministry actually do something and then i think a whole lot i think people would be a whole lot more willing to attend the Novus Ordo and would feel more at home and would feel it's more traditional if the liberal bishops were being disciplined and the ordinary form was being done properly. People wouldn't feel this need to try to return to the preconciliar ways of doing things. I don't know. I, I hope that Wait. helps a little bit. It does. Can I say one thing? Yeah. Wait, I, I, I see what you're saying. And I defend the Novus Ordo all the time. I mean, I grew up in it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the people who say oh, it's not reverential or, you know, it's, they're all clown masses. Yeah, yeah, that's not true. Right. Um, but what I will say is that the Novus Ordo, if you go to one Novus Ordo church and then down the street you go to another one, there are going to be differences. And I'm old enough now that I remember that, those differences seem to be getting bigger, starker. There seem to be, uh, the Novus Ordo seem to be more what, uniform what's the solution? 30 years ago. I, I, and I recognize I think the solution is returning to the Latin mass. No, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know if I buy, I don't know if I buy that the mass that converted the world, the mass that, that that's, saved that's the world that's from rhetoric. Islamic terror. That, that's rhetoric. That's absolute rhetoric. I think you need to study the history of the Roman mass. That's absolute rhetoric. But that was God's um, hand through history. We, we still have that mass. We still have it. We still substantially have that in the ordinary form. That's rhetoric. We still have it. And by the way, the Roman rite's not the only one out there converting people. We have plenty of Eastern rites. That's just pure rhetoric. Study the history of the Roman well, rite. Well, there, there is there Eastern rite did, com, did convert people, but there is no comparison to what the Latins did. The Jesuits themselves as an order did more than probably the entire Eastern world. The, the world was converted primarily by Latin. It was the Latin Europeans who spread Christianity, and they spread it through the Latin Mass. So and how you can know we say that, that Mass, mass that they were efficient. celebrating when these countries were being ref converted was not the Tridentine Mass. Substantially, we've had the same Roman Rite, but there were some pretty big accidental differences. So, I mean... It, you just need to study the history of the Roman right. It's not, it's not this one uniform monolith that just converted everybody and all of a sudden a Vatican II it radically changed. No. We still have that mass. We just need big? to reform the way we celebrate it. That's all. And you said the solution is well, to return to the Latin mass. No. 
that we needed some reforms. The solution is stop having all these abuses in the Novus Ordo. The solution is start doing it more consistently and uniformly and reverently. It doesn't logically follow, oh, let's just press the reset button. We can press the reset button all day long, but we, there were still some things about the Trident Team Mass that need to be reformed. And let's be real. The reset button's not going to be pressed anymore. We, we need to move on from that dream. It's not going to happen. Um, it, at this point, that's not possible. What needs to happen, however, is that we have one form in the Roman right, and it's done properly and traditionally. Well, things legitimately develop. I get that. Things do legitimately develop. But the, dif the differences over the centuries in the Tridentine right or what became the Tridentine right, I think are minuscule. I mean, you can see the direct line from the, you know, through, through history. I've seen some pretty big differences in, in the Roman right historically. I wouldn't agree with that. There, now, I wouldn't say that there are substantial. Well, I, in other words, I, I would still say that it's still the Roman right, but there's been some pretty big differences in the history of our right. That doesn't, however, mean that all of the changes that we made in the post-conciliar era are somehow okay. That doesn't mean that either, but it does mean that there have been some pretty big changes throughout history in our Roman right. Uh, okay, but would you agree that the would you agree that the Tridentine Mass does a better job of having uniformity at least than would, the Novus Ordo does? In its, not in objectively, its no. But I understand. Not objectively, but I would say the priests who are celebrating the Tridentine Mass do a better job. Absolutely. Those priests do a better job, okay. but that's not because of the mass, objectively speaking. It's because of the celebrant, and that, that's what I'm saying. We just need to, we need to reform who we have celebrating the liturgy, how it's done, things like that, and this won't be an issue anymore. Well, why is there an intrinsic difference between a Novus Ordo priest and a Tridentine mass-trained priest? Yeah. I mean, I think I, that, there might... Yeah, you know, I think that part of it has to do with the men that we're selecting and the ones that somehow end up getting in. And I'm surprised they ever get ordained, uh, but God bless them that they do. The traditional and faithful ones that, that do, they end up gravitating more towards the Tridentine Mass because they generally tend to see the priests who are there. They don't abuse things. There's not nearly as much liturgical abuse and it's done better. So they gravitate more towards that. And I get that. I understand that. But there's no reason why it has to be that way. What it is, is we need to fix the, the, the process by which we select priests, stop uh, getting rid of seminarians who are good and conservative, and then only bring in the problematic ones. We need to reform those things. So I recognize, I mean, in order to fix this problem with the way the Novus Ordo is done, a lot of other things have to be done. But guess what? It could be done. The Pope has that authority. And he could put teeth behind this and actually bring it about. And he's not doing it. And he's going to have to give an answer for that. But it could be done and it should be done. But it doesn't logically follow that the solution is let's just hit the reset button and return to the Latin mass. No. I don't see Well, that. I don't know if I would say it's a reset button. I mean, our church is a universal church. It's eternal. It was around even before Christ walked the earth. It's that link to that eternal church that's always been around the roman i don't think right, it's, i don't think it's a low i mean the roman right doesn't equal the eternal church i, I i'm not seeing the connection it, it almost sounds like you're equating the roman right with the church itself well we are latin catholics right yes but the popes have well recognized that all of our liturgical rights have equal value and are to be venerated equally correct yeah One correct no but the other. every but ever but the eastern catholics are under the roman pontiff they are roman of course catholics they're under themselves. the church of the greeks refer to themselves early greeks refer to themselves as rome yeah eastern catholics are under the pope who's the bishop of rome sure yeah right so that that and even if you want to make the argument that the Latin rite is a uh, like more of a regional or ethnic uh, rite, like the Eastern rites are, well, I mean, don't we still have, which I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but I mean, I think it's both. 
I think it's both. I think I think the Latin right is both an ethnic right and a regional. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I was just kidding. Oh, okay, sorry, I was just kidding. Yeah, sorry, um, I, had, I had my son the, uh, coming up. I had to mute there for a second. Go ahead. No, I know you're a good Catholic. You're making new Catholic. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> uh, it's good. Uh, no, I mean, I and I would say that you know, I think you maybe argue the Latin right is like a regional or ethnic right, but I think it's also a universal right. How is that possible? Well, all things are possible with God. I but don't see that. Even if we're going to argue that it, even if we're going to argue that it's a, a regional right or something like that, I mean, don't we Western Latin Catholics? Don't we? Ha I mean, don't we have the protect? Shouldn't our culture be preserved? I mean, why? Why is, why is it, it always been. art? It has been in the ordinary form. It just needs to be celebrated properly. That's all. That's the thing. I'm not buying this well, idea that the ordinary form doesn't preserve our right. It does. It just needs to be celebrated properly. That's all. Well, if that were the case, then the Pope would just ban the Latin Mass because we already have it, right? No, but he I doesn't do he, that because he recognizes he could, there's a preference he issue. He could. He could. But he's being prudent, at least here, in trying to accommodate people who are attached to it. And I get that. I understand that. So, the, so there's some admittance that the Latin right has a reason to exist. And if it has a reason to exist and people identify hey, with you're, it, you're once again and they identify it, they, you're once again equating the Latin right with the extraordinary form. You're still doing that. And I'm saying the Latin right is the ordinary form. Um, and the extraordinary form is one expression of that Latin right. The extraordinary form is one expression. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because the the Tridentine Mass is only one expression of the Roman Rite. I mean, we've we've had some variances in our Roman Rite historically, and as it was promulgated by Quo Primum, that's one expression of it. Sure, um, as it's promulgated by Paul VI and John Paul II, that's one expression of it. And right now, that's the most current. But it's still the Roman right. But if that, I, I don't equate the extraordinary form with the Roman right to the exclusion of the ordinary form. Well, I'm not saying anything about the Novus Ordo, but okay. what I am saying is, is that a thousand years ago, my ancestors were celebrating at least a variant of the Tridentine right. A variant, or the Tridentine a variant right of it. A variant of it that was um, in some ways pretty different than it is today in ways that are probably analogous to the way the Novus Ordo is compared to the extraordinary form today. So that, that's what I'm saying. Study the history of the Roman Rite. Get Adrian Fortescue's book on the Mass. Read that. Get uh, Jurgens, uh, not Jurgens. Wow. Uh, get Jungmann's um, book, two volumes, on the Roman Rite. Study the history there, and you're going to see, okay, yeah, this, this isn't as clear-cut as I thought. I once maintained the same view and impression that you have. Start to study the history of the Roman Rite, and you'll come away a little bit more open to the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, and you'll see a little bit more discontinuity. Well, what would be a significant difference like, from a thousand years ago to today? Communion in the hand? In uh, communion for infants? Um, the chalice for the laity? Um, Let's see, uh, women deacons, although they generally did not uh, participate um, in, the, in the mass uh, at the altar. Um, sometimes they, at certain points, the Our Father wasn't said. Uh, that had to be added to the liturgy. Um, there were parts to the uh, outside of the canon that were added. Um, the prayers at the end, um, with the Gospel of John were added. Uh, there, there was a lot of things, a lot of elements to it that were added over time. And not all of them just organically, you know, the communities just celebrating these things and it organically developed. Uh, I mean, there is some of that. But some of this was just added by popes. So uniformly, uni, uni, I'm sorry, unilaterally added. 
again, get the history of the mask by uh, Fortescue, and he'll go over some of those elements. And I think when you see that, you'll say, okay, well, um, the, the discontinuity that I see objectively between the missile of Paul the Sixth or John Paul the Second and uh, John the Twenty Third are not as big as some of the differences I'm seeing here historically. So I can deal with these differences. At least that's the the takeaway that I have when I I read the history of the mass. So I don't know. If you come away with a different view, I'd like to like the, like the St. Michael's prayer would be an example, right? Yeah, I mean that's a more recent that's, that's, example. That's pretty late. Yeah, that, that's really late. Sure, sure. But I mean, um, you you start to look at okay, how did this mass develop? And it was not done just uniformly and um, the way that it's done uh, by 1962. There were a lot of elements that were added over time. There were things that were done differently, and I say all that to say, okay, there have been developments, so we need to recognize that it's legitimate that we have that in the post-conciliar era. But that being said, I still want to say there's still some work that needs to be done to the Novus Ordo objectively. And then there's a lot of work that needs to be done practically feet on the ground subjectively with priests who celebrate it. I mean, and also when it comes to this topic, let's not forget there's a, there's a lot of differences and distinctions that need to be made. One, there's Sancra Sanctum Concilium and what it called for. Two, there's the actual uh, concilium that was uh, commissioned under Paul VI, uh, led by Bunini. There's it and what it came to. There's the actual Missal of Paul the six, what he promulgated, there's a difference between Sancra Sanctum Concilium, Bunini's Concilium, and the actual missile that was promulgated. And then John, the, uh, John Paul II's revisions to it. And then a fifth element, what actually is practiced feet on the ground. We got to make distinctions between all of them. Um, so I say all that to say, if we do the Roman Mass uh, properly, if it's done objectively speaking, I don't think there will be a problem. But what's often done is it's not celebrated right, and people see what's happening on the parish level, and they then equate that with the Missal itself. They equate that with Bunini's uh, Concilium. They equate that with Sancra Santa Concilium itself, and then Vatican II. And there's distinctions that need to be made all along. Uh, I know I'm rambling a little bit. I hope that helps. No, you're not rambling. It's all great information. I didn't know. But, like, with Pope Benedict, I mean, with Summa, I can't even think of the name of it, uh, Pontificus Forum. I get horrible with Latin. Uh, ironically. Uh, and even with uh, Pope Francis, they both, in their own way, I mean, Pope Francis, with what he did with the SSPX, how he, more, he kind of more regularized them. With what Pope Benedict uh, did uh, with uh, what he did for the Latin Mass. I mean, that's the, the vicar of Christ. He's showing that there is value in the extraordinary form. Now, again, not is. saying anything bad about of the Novus Ordo. Of course there is to the extraordinary but form. So, How so if, that, if there's value there, well, yes. And if there's value there, that, and that I think does go back to history. Because I agree. I, I know what you're saying, that you know, there's been development. I agree with that. But it kind of strikes me as something like real old, the Celtic Church. There's a lot of people that try to argue that the, the the Celts weren't Roman Catholics originally. Well, that's nonsense. Just because you wear your hair differently and you have, if you're debating about a different date in right, Easter right. does not mean you don't recognize the Pope. So I think your argument is kind of like that. I mean, yeah, the Tridentine rite that I go to today isn't exactly like it was a thousand years ago, but it's pretty darn close. And when I go to a Novus, uh, I guess I will say a little something about the Novus Ordo, but I've grown up with, when I've grown up in it, while I find it reverent and valid and the Eucharist is there, mm-hmm. and you know, people would say it's not valid, that's wrong. But when I go to a Novus Ordo uh, uh, parish, when I go to a Novus Ordo mass, it is not the same. It is not the yeah, same you're, you're telling You're talking to me tradition. about how it's being practiced, and I agree with you it's not being practiced well, but that's a different issue. 
than the actual mass itself. Now we're talking about how is it being practiced? And here we agree, it's not being practiced very well. But there, whatever value you get from the Latin mass, the Tridentine mass, the same value objectively is there in the ordinary form. It's just that some people might be attached to it, so there's a subjective value there. I get that. But objectively speaking, whatever value you find in the preconciliar liturgy, you're going to find in the postconciliar liturgy. The problem is. I would is, still argue the Latin Mass is. Well, I'm just saying the problem is the way it's celebrated is not being done properly. And so that ends up becoming problematic. Well, and, I, and I would still argue. I, again, I grew up in the Novus Ordo. The people that claim that it's all clown masses, I'm not saying you're saying that. But the people who do that, are, those are lies. No, That's we're, we're talking non, non clown masses, non gay masses. We're talking about right. regular Novus Ordo at your average parish. Right. And I, that needs work. And I wasn't saying that. Right, and I didn't mean that you were saying that. Right, right, but right. what I do, but even with even with a reverential Novus Ordo Mass, even with that, even with great priests, which there are in the Novus Ordo, or the greatest, greater church, I don't like calling it the Novus Ordo Church, I don't like that. But but uh, th there's great priests, but even with all that, it's still not the same. And I would push right, back. Well, let, let me, I let do me think this, that... What if you have? Well, hold on. Just one last point. One last point. Back to history. I do think the Tridentine Mass is more of a tether for me back to my ancestors and back to Calvary. I think it's. I think it's more of a tether. Sorry, I'll shut up. What do you think about a Novus Ordo done with plenty of Latin, a ton of Gregorian chant, very proper, very solemn, very reverent, in a gorgeous building, with a priest wearing traditional vestments? with beefed up prayers and with um, communion on the tongue and kneeling. But it's the Novus Ordo. All of, all of what I just said, but Novus Ordo, what do you think of that? Is that substantial? Is that really a, a huge difference from what you experience already in the Tridentine Mass? I'm not wimping out. I'm going to answer that, but just let me give you a quick anecdote. Oh, real and, quick. and add a word. The first, and add a word. Let me add that. One. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that would kind of get to what I was going to say. Yeah. And the, the first time I, I didn't go to my Latin mass, like in person, physically until I was in my thirties. Mm -hmm. And the first, I know other people have different experiences and it's not about emotion, whether you have this experience or not. It, it is, it is that tether back to Calvary and back to our ancestors, I believe. But, the first time I ever went to a Latin mass, and I do not know theology. I try to pay, I try to uh, keep up with you guys. Uh, you guys are more well read than I'll ever be. Um, I'm your typical bad, you know, Novus Ordo educated Catholic. But the first time I ever went to a Latin mass, it just hit. This Obviously, is the way it's supposed I, to be. It's and, and, be and, the, and, the, and, and the biggest yeah. thing for that, the biggest thing for that, was because the priest was facing God. He was Look, facing I, the I'm altar. In agreement he with wasn't, you. I'm it wasn't about you. me. It wasn't about <laughs> me anymore. It was about it was about God. It was about a temple Look, of God. The way I was like, we don't. This is what the here. Crusaders fought for. We don't. No, disagree. I know. This is what the Crusaders fought for. And 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 yeah, what you're saying sounds good. It does sound good. I mean, I'm not knowledgeable enough to know what other differences there would be. And I mean, like one good thing about this uh, this. Uh, I don't know what you're about to say. I don't want to get you like the the whole nonsense we're going on right now with the with the with the sniffles. Is I went to a Novus Ordo mass recently, and there was no um, handshaking. You know, right. and I never thought about that growing up. But after going to the Latin mass, I I'm sorry, maybe this is sin. Maybe I need to go well, confession. Yeah. I hate the handshaking. I hate the handshaking. I can't I stand it. it. <laughs> and like, you know, I'll I'll actually maybe this is disrespectful, but I actually pray the Ave Maria while they do the handshake and now if I go to an oversort on that. And it's just, uh, so I don't know what the differences other than that would be. What you're saying sounds good, but yeah. again, it's just like, why don't we just have the Latin Mass then? I mean, well, you know, because, we, we, again, we, we had some great stuff. Yeah, but we, we did need some reforms, but we, we ended up getting a whole lot more than just reforms. We got a Why not bring the reforms that you think are valid? I don't yeah. know if it's necessarily good, but like the challenge, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't we bring that into the Trident team, right? Instead that, of creating a whole thing. new thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Whether you bring those reforms to the Tridentine right or reform the ordinary form, you're going to get the exact same thing. So it doesn't matter which way you do it, as long as you end up getting it. But the point is, 
Look, I'm in agreement with you. If you go to the average Novus Ordo and then walk into a lap mass, there's going to be a, a very palatable difference. I agree. I'm talking about the ordinary form objectively, properly, how it should be done. According to the examples that I just gave you, you would not be able to distinguish it from the lap mass. So the point is what we need to do is celebrate the ordinary form properly, and this won't even be an issue anymore. So, great call. Well, then let's do that. Yeah. But we still got to make the bishops and the pope do it. Uh, well, <laughs> we're in agreement there. I've, I've been saying all along, the people who can fix this problem in the crisis, it's the bishops and the pope. They have the authority and the power, the ability to fix the problem, and they're going to answer for the fact that they haven't been. All right. I appreciate you calling. I'm going to go ahead and go to one last caller here. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, caller, you're live with Reason and Theology. What's your name and what's your question? Hey, uh, my name is Rob. Um, you can hear me okay? Yeah. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Um, so I just heard what you were saying about how, like, you know, it's up to the bishops to kind of push uh, these changes to kind of standardize the ordinary form. Yeah. Um, but then we've also gotten to this point because the bishops are, I guess you could say, slacking. Yeah. So is there kind of momentum that needs to come from the laity as well, from like a grassroots sort of level level that really needs to, yeah. I guess, put a fire under their, yeah. you know what? And we can do what... I mean, we, we can do our best, but at the end of the day, we shouldn't even have to do anything. They, they should already be... Uh, tuned enough to know what, what's going on. They should already know uh, what we're needing, what our needs are as laity. We, we shouldn't have to just cry out, hey, stop abusing us, give us better liturgies. Uh, they, they should already know that. But yeah, I'm sure it will help if we do that as laity. But at the end of the day, ultimately, they're going to have to be the ones who make the changes. And you're right. We're here because they haven't done that. And I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon. Uh, we can continue to speak out against it and tell them we need uh, we need you to fix this. We need you to fix abuses in our parishes. Uh, we can continue to do the right thing, but ultimately, I think it's going to be time before this is uh, changed. Ultimately, this boils down to the fact that we have people in ministry who shouldn't be in ministry. So this, at the end of the day, in my opinion, goes to the papacy. The papacy should be holding things together. The papacy should be disciplining these wayward bishops. The papacy should be doing uh, these things. So ultimately, it falls on him. And, and not to be disrespectful, but and I, you know, I don't mean to say this in a hopeful way, but do we just wait for them all to pass? Like, I, honestly, <laughs> and we, I, we wait I, for the next I, wave? I, kind honestly, of I think that the next papacy is going to be more difficult than the current one. So uh, I think even if Pope Francis you know, were to... Uh, we're, we're no longer with us, I think that we're still going to have an even more difficult uh, trial to go through. So <clears throat> I think it's going to be a long time before there's actual real uh, substantial changes when it comes to this crisis. Um, I mean, decades, you know, 50, 100 years, whatever, who knows? I think it's going to be a long time before the rot in the church is fixed and changed. Um, it is what it is. We have to come to terms with that. We have to recognize it and we have to suffer and do what we're supposed to do in the meantime. It could be that we don't see the crisis in the church really, um, changed in our lifetime. It is what it is. I'm sure there were quite a few people who died when the Aryan crisis was, you know, going full blast and full swing. Right. And they never got to see, uh, the counter to it. So uh, that could be the case with us. The point yeah. is we have to do the right thing no matter what. No, that makes sense. And I, I agree with the suffering aspect. I think that's kind of uh, part of what it means to be a and Catholic. It is, and it is a um, suffering, my, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, and I have one last question. Yeah. From the perspective of us in, in the United States and ordinary form versus Europe or the rest of the world, is ours on a level of greater inconsistency while Europe is, you know, more standardized. Uh, as, please uh, repeat that for me. Is the United States more inconsistent than Europe in what regard? 
Oh, sorry. In terms of like ordinary form masses, it seems like the spectrum of ordinary form in the U.S., obviously because we live here, it seems like there's just an inconsistency across the board. Mm. But elsewhere in the world, is there more of a consistency? Yeah, I, I don't know. From from what I see, it looks pretty bad worldwide, but I, I don't know. I don't know on that one. Got it. Yeah, I can only speak about right, no the United States and my, my territory, really. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something worth looking into. Cool. All right, well, I appreciate your time. God bless. Thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Y'all, we're at two and a half hours, so we'll probably just go ahead and... Uh, Go ahead and call it there. Sorry, I got a little short in this microphone uh, cable, it looks like. I need to fix that. Uh, but anyways, I appreciate y'all calling in. Great questions. I also really enjoyed them. Very lively and engaging. Also, thank y'all for all the questions there in the chat. Sorry, I couldn't get to them all. Uh, but we'll continue to do these open mics. Um, I'll probably do them every Friday. Uh, I intend to do an open mic with Mike every Friday and try to start to organize the formats of the shows to particular nights every day um, so mondays is going to be dedicated to one thing or tuesdays is to another and fridays to another so that you can start to see some consistency in the programming so uh more to come there but again thank y'all for watching also thank y'all for those super chats i appreciate it by the way i think there was one super chat i didn't get to let me go ahead and answer it i think it was from jared I uh, took a screenshot of it just in case it moves on me. Uh, this was my super chat. How do you suggest we push for a more traditional Reverend Novus Ordo? Should we talk with our priest, contact the bishop? Absolutely. Let them know. Let them know your thoughts. Um, but just, just right now, aside from contacting your bishop, your priest, uh, you know, prayer, things like that, uh, there's not a whole lot we can do, frankly. I mean, that that is a lot. That is perhaps enough in some cases, but in some cases that's not going to be good enough and you're just going to have to suffer, unfortunately. Uh, that's the case in my diocese. I, I don't have a Latin mass anywhere nearby. And when I've asked for one, I didn't get one. So um, sometimes you, you do what you can and uh, like you said, contact the priest, contact the bishop, let them know what you think. Uh, try to report abuses. And I mean, real abuses, like the precious blood is being spilled or something like that. Don't be petty with it, but report significant ones to your bishop and ask for things to be changed. Uh, but at the end of the day, if they're not, uh, continue to pray for your shepherds, and ultimately it's going to be on them. Uh, but great question. Again, I appreciate all those super chats there. Uh, I think I see one more coming up. Uh, let me see. I can pull it up. Ah, thank you. A small thanks for the calm you bring uh, to big issues. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I hope this was helpful. So uh, if y'all find this helpful, if y'all found my, my position, my take on these issues helpful, let me know in the chat. I want to know your comments. So make sure to put those in there. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell for notifications so you can know when I go live. Don't forget to hit the like button too. And then also check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us. Um, we have extra content on there, and I'm going to be adding some more pretty soon. Uh, so check us out there. All right. That's going to do it. We will see y'all soon. Till next time. God bless.